This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is the 210th edition of the program. Today is Friday, September 20th, and before we get started, I want to take some time to thank all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased their monthly pledge, and that includes Barbara Sherman, Blue Nebula, Brian Hevlin, Seprin Sip, Christian LaSalle, D, Daphne Bruley, Gregory T. Hart, Ingrid Gottschalk, Jacob Williams, Jamal Arberry, Jeff Hassinger, Jeffrey Brown, John Rines, Julie Mazels, Karen Webster, Catherine Busby, Kenny N., Nelson Olvera, Nemanja Dukic, Patrick Cheek, Ryan Clodier, Sujit Ravindran, The Needle Drop, Anthony Fantano, love him, Trent Hansen, and Walter Daly. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support or patreon.com forward slash humanist report. So I was off the previous week, but I'm back and we've got a lot to talk about. So this week on the Humanist Report podcast, Working Families Party faced backlash for endorsing Elizabeth Warren over Bernie Sanders. Michael Moore confronts Bill Maher over his newfangled radical centrism, and Bill Maher's stupidity utterly shocked one of his guests. Pete Buttigieg is now getting desperate and resorting to attacks and lies about Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders has had it with Joe Biden's blatant corporatism and is now calling him out more aggressively. Candace Owens showed that she's not very good at grifting because she couldn't even answer the most basic question about Donald Trump ever. Also, Bernie Sanders releases a housing for all plan that is incredibly robust. I'll talk about why Elizabeth Warren supporters are choosing her over Bernie Sanders, who Trump is the most afraid to run against in 2020. We'll talk about Tulsi Gabbard's clash with Fox News' Neil Cavuto and Trump's decision to revoke California's autonomy to create their own auto emission standards. And finally on the program, we will talk to 2020 congressional candidate from Illinois, Robert Emmons, Jr. So that's what we've got on the agenda for this week's episode. Hopefully you guys will enjoy the program. Let's go ahead and get right into it. So for those of you who don't know, Elizabeth Warren has essentially caught up to Bernie Sanders. When you look at aggregate polling data, it is now the case that they are in a statistical tie. This is a dead heat. So it may very well be the case that we soon need to get very vocal about the differences between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. The only problem and reason why I think it doesn't really make strategic sense to do this now is because there's a bigger target still in the race. That is Joe Biden, and he still is pretty much the front runner by numerous accounts. Now, his lead has in fact shrunk. And, you know, when you look at the trajectory, I think it makes sense to predict that it will continue to go down. With that being said, though, it really doesn't make sense for Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren to start aiming at each other now, because if they start taking shots at one another and they start driving down support for one another, then they are effectively doing Joe Biden's bidding for him, which doesn't make any sense because he's still the biggest target. He still is the worst case scenario where if he wins, I think we're looking at another four years of Donald Trump. So it doesn't make any sense strategically for Bernie and Warren to start taking shots at one another so long as Biden is pulling ahead of everyone. But that doesn't mean that we don't at some point have to start really distinguishing between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. But that just means that in order to get to that point, we really need to go harder on Joe Biden. And, you know, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, it's evident that they both know that it makes no sense for them currently to go after one another. It's why at the debates, they've kind of tag-teamed Joe Biden. 
But one issue that I've kind of taken with uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, to be fair, is that they both, even if they criticize Joe Biden, they've gone too soft on him. When this individual is not looking out for normal Americans, he is doing all of these high dollar fundraisers with fossil fuel executives. It's, it's, it's just absurd. Why are we even considering Joe Biden? So you have to get more aggressive and you have to take on Joe Biden and take him out as quickly as possible so we can get down to the real race, the real primary, which is between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. I think Bernie Sanders knows this and it's why as of late, he started to really hone his craft when it comes to criticizing Joe Biden. So Bloomberg tweeted out an article titled Biden praises pharma to donors as he pushes to cut prices. And as Jennifer Epstein writes, Joe Biden praised pharmaceutical companies on Saturday, offering a line that drew pushback from Democratic opponents who have demonized the industry's focus on profits. By the way, great drug companies out there, except a couple of opioid outfits, the former vice president told donors at the Dallas home of David Jenica a craniofacial surgeon. Now, Bernie Sanders then tweeted in response to this article saying, I disagree with Joe Biden. The pharmaceutical companies are greedy, corrupt, and engaged in price fixing. At a time when their behavior is literally killing people, America needs a president who isn't going to appease and compliment drug companies. We need a president who will take on the pharmaceutical industry, whether they like it or not. That is exactly what we will do. And this is really what Bernie Sanders should be doing, because we keep seeing article after article about Joe Biden doing these private fundraisers in the Hamptons getting extra cozy with the establishment and big dollar donors and it's just it's inconceivable that he thinks this is still acceptable in 2019 i mean what are you doing hillary clinton did this in 2016 she lost because everyone viewed her as the establishment candidate and rightfully so so at a time when people are disenfranchised and feel disenchanted with the establishment for you to not call this out it's it doesn't even make sense. Joe Biden is your opponent. So you are in a primary against him. Now is the time to go negative because it's not bad if you're going negative for the American people. And whenever there's another candidate that takes shots at Joe Biden and very harshly criticizes him and points out the differences between them and him, they get a boost. So it only makes sense for Bernie Sanders to aggressively go after Joe Biden as a means of showing why he's the true candidate who is best suited to take on Donald Trump. And understand, Bernie Sanders has the most to gain by taking down Joe Biden because numerous polls have shown that a lot of Joe Biden supporters view Bernie as their second choice, and I know that that doesn't really make a lot of sense, but I think Bernie is benefiting from name recognition. So let's use that to our advantage. Let's take down Joe Biden, and Bernie's got to be aggressive. And what he's doing here by ripping Joe Biden for this, this is precisely the strategy that he needs. Now, I want to share another criticism that Bernie Sanders had of Joe Biden because we all saw the debate where Joe Biden was lying about Medicare for all. And Bernie Sanders was asked after the debate in an, in an interview with Anderson Cooper to um, further, you know, elaborate on his response to one of Joe Biden's criticisms of Medicare for all, specifically with regard to the cost. And Bernie Sanders just pretty bluntly said, Joe Biden doesn't know what he's talking about. Take a look. There was a moment where Vice President Biden uh, contradicted you or went after you on, on that plan. I just want to play that for our viewers and then talk about it. The fact of the matter is, we're in a situation where, if you notice, he hadn't answered the question. This is about candor, honesty, big ideas. Well, let's have a big idea. The, the tax of 2% that the senator is talking about, that raises about $3 billion. Guess what? That leaves you about $28 billion short. The senator said before, it's going to cost you in your pay. There will be a deductible in your paycheck. You're going to, the middle class person, someone making 60 grand with three kids, they're going to end up paying $5,000 more. They're going to end up paying 4% more on their income tax. That's a reality. Now, it's not a bad idea if you like it. I don't like it. I think he meant trillion when he was saying billion, but uh, your, what, what's, your, what's your response to that? I think Joe doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, I just got to, I like Joe. Joe is a friend of mine. I just don't think he knows what he's talking about. He said, we're spending $30, billion, $30 trillion over 10 years on health care. Wow, yeah, it's a lot of money. It is. If we maintain the status quo, according to a study done by 
the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Studies, will spend $50 trillion. Hey, Joe, we're now spending twice as much per person on health care as the people of any other nation. We're paying by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. The current system is incredibly expensive. Every study that I have seen shows that Medicare for all, which eliminates the $100 billion in profits made by the health care industry, which ends the incredible bureaucracy and administrative nightmares inherent in a system which has hundreds of different insurance programs that have to be, you know, have to be dealt with by administrators. We can save many, many hundreds of billions of dollars, provide health care to every man, woman, and child, and save the average person significant sums of money on their health care costs. That was strong. That was a very, very strong response. Bernie, you know, it's long overdue for him to start coming out and saying, Joe Biden doesn't know what he's talking about. Call him out for the corporate shill that he is. But I will say this, Bernie. You don't have to qualify every Joe Biden criticism with some, you know, caveat about, well, you know, he is my friend and he's a nice guy. I know him personally. Drop that. Joe Biden is nobody's friend but corporate America's. He's not our friend. He's not looking out for us. And we are banking on him losing so Trump loses. Because if he wins the nomination, I think there's a 50-50 chance that Trump wins. And I don't want to roll the dice. And you can look at public opinion polls and I think correctly point out that Joe Biden is still polling better than Donald Trump in head-to-head -head matchups. But still, so was Hillary Clinton at this point. And I don't want to risk it. So we need to take down Joe Biden. Even some corporate media pundits are realizing this man is a joke and he can't win. So Bernie doesn't need to qualify his criticisms of Joe Biden with, you know, I'm his friend and, you know, we know each other. I've known the, the Biden family for a long time. Drop all of that. This is a primary. You can be a little bit more ruthless and it doesn't matter. They're still going to accuse you of always yelling and being overly aggressive. Just communicate to voters that you're looking out for them and Joe Biden isn't. So it really is important for Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren to take down Joe Biden because neither of them can win this primary if Biden is still such a gigantic threat. Now, at the Iowa caucus, in spite of polls, Joe Biden could still lose because, you know, these grassroots candidates, more progressive figures, tend to overperform at these caucuses. This is what happened in 2008. Um, and this is something that could very well happen in 2020. It's just a matter of if we really want to get down to what this primary race will most likely be about between Bernie and Warren, we've got to take out Joe Biden first. So if Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren start really relentlessly going after Joe Biden, this will benefit both of them because the quicker we get to them criticizing each other once Biden is kind of out of the equation the quicker we can really see who the eventual nominee will be. And I hope it's going to be Bernie Sanders. But currently, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren have got to go after Joe Biden. And I think that calling out Joe Biden's willingness to shill is a really important first step in that direction. During the 2016 Democratic Party primary process, the Working Families Party endorsed Bernie Sanders over Hillary Clinton. That was obviously an easy choice because if you purport to represent the working families of America, then it's not even a question. Of course, you opt for Bernie Sanders over someone who is a neoliberal centrist like Hillary Clinton. So this time around, they were planning to make another endorsement. And as of September 3rd, they announced that they would be holding an official vote for the party's 2020 endorsement between five candidates, Cory Booker, Julian Castro, Bill de Blasio, Bernie Sanders, and Elizabeth Warren. Now, first of all, I don't necessarily know what criteria they used to narrow it down to these five candidates, but Cory Booker, Julian Castro, Bill de Blasio, I mean, come on. Now, if, if I'm remembering correctly, um, as a DSA member, when they did their endorsement process, it was just an up or down vote for Bernie Sanders. They sent us the card and we voted yes or no if we wanted to endorse Bernie Sanders. And look, that's the way that it should be. If you are truly a grassroots organization, then it's not even a question. You just should be savvy enough to know the difference between someone who wants social democracy and someone who wants a little bit more humane version of capitalism. It's not even a question. So the fact that they even had Cory Booker and Julian Castro in the running is 
pretty much an embarrassment for the working party's family. Nonetheless, they held the vote, and the way it works is leadership gets 50% of the vote share, and members who pay monthly dues of $10 per month, they get the other 50% of the vote share, and it's conducted using a ranked choice voting system. And now, the working party's family has made their choice, the results are in, and they have officially chosen to endorse Elizabeth Warren over Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Now, as Daniel Morans of HuffPost reports, the endorsement reflecting the views of 61% of working families, party members, and leaders in a ranked choice voting system is a particularly sharp disappointment for Sanders, who picked up the group's backing in the 2016 election cycle, but received just 36% of the vote from participating members this time around. The Sanders campaign's political director, Analilia Mejia, is the former executive director of the New Jersey Working Family. Party. So they made their endorsement. There's nothing we can do about it. But let me just say this if you are opting to endorse a candidate and you're choosing between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and you're really trying to make that choice, then you can say, sure, these are both solid candidates. But when it comes down to the differences between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, there are many. It's not like, you know, they're indistinguishable from one another. These are two very different candidates with very different views for the future of this country. Bernie Sanders supports social democracy and Elizabeth Warren supports a reformed version of capitalism. And when it comes to policy differences, Bernie Sanders has supported Medicare for all for 40 plus years, whereas Elizabeth Warren has been waffling back and forth multiple times throughout the course of this year. In addition, Bernie Sanders has a progressive non-interventionist, anti-imperialist foreign policy agenda, whereas Elizabeth Warren hasn't really laid out her agenda when it comes to foreign policy, and what we've heard is troubling. She also recently failed to explain why she voted for Donald Trump's military budget. On top of that, she's only swearing off big fundraisers until the general election. Then if she wins, all bets are off, and then it's fundraisers, I guess, and big money. That's what she said to Jen Uger of TYT in an interview, at least, whereas Bernie Sanders has permanently sworn off PAC money. He's sworn off these private fundraisers because they are a corrosive influence. Also, Elizabeth Warren is assuring Democratic Party elites that she doesn't want to fundamentally change the status quo. And she's getting buddy-buddy with people like Hillary Clinton, who represents everything wrong with the Democratic Party. And Bernie Sanders is not doing that. Now, let me just emphasize here, I'm not an Elizabeth Warren hater. I think she's a solid candidate, and I think that she is running a really good campaign. But if we are forced to choose between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren during a presidential primary, the choice is clear if you truly care about working families in America, if you truly want to get us on that trajectory of social democracy. It's Bernie Sanders, it's clear. It's not like the only difference is that, well, Elizabeth Warren, you know, she is a little bit more wonkier and she's stronger on areas X, Y, and Z. No, that's not the case. When you have Bernie Sanders in the race, the one candidate who has explicitly said he wants social democracy, that's an obvious choice. It's Bernie over Elizabeth Warren. Now, of course, because they made this endorsement, this led to a lot of backlash on Twitter. And let me remind you that the reason why they're getting backlash, I think rightfully so, is because this goes against their stated agenda. And they've been doing this lately. So in 2018, in New York's 14th congressional district, they endorsed Joe Crowley over Alexandria ocasio Cortez. And here they are again, endorsing the candidate who clearly is not the best for working families. Is Elizabeth Warren bad for working families? No. But is she anywhere near as good as Bernie Sanders? Absolutely not. And people vocalized that in the responses here. So for example, Michael Brooks tweeted, the most pro-worker candidate in modern history, building a multiracial working coalition and a clear social democratic platform, and you don't endorse that campaign. You guys will be known for this now instead of just getting played by Cuomo, 
Also, change your name. Megan Day of Jacobin writes, Working Families Party should have endorsed Bernie Sanders. Bernie has a much more working class and racially diverse base, and he's focused explicitly on building working class movements on the ground. He's the most pro-labor presidential candidate in living memory. This is a real shame. Ben says he canceled his recurring donations. And when you just look at the level of enthusiasm for Bernie Sanders on the YouTube page for the Working Families Party, it's evident that the only videos that gain any sort of traction whatsoever are the videos that feature Bernie Sanders. Any other video, you know, they'd be lucky to get 10 views and the one with Elizabeth Warren only got a couple hundred. Bernie Sanders, however, he clearly has a lot of support. So this doesn't make any sense. It's perplexing and it makes less sense when you consider that one of the Working Families Party's main issues is single-payer Medicare for All. Now, in an interview with Anna Kasparian on No Filter, Ben Burgess explains that that was one of the main issues for the Working Families Party. So to support Elizabeth Warren over Bernie Sanders when the Working Families Party has been a champion of single-payer health care, Bernie Sanders has been promoting single-payer Medicare for All for decades, and Elizabeth Warren only formally came out and endorsed it in 2017. And on top of that, she's been going back and forth, back and forth, and she finally put up Medicare for All on her website. And as Ben Burgess is going to explain here, it's really not that clear that she supports the same version of Medicare for All as Bernie Sanders. Yeah, I think that's disappointing. Uh, and it's especially strange to me because one of the Working Families Party's big issues has always been uh, single-payer health insurance. And uh, and Bernie is, I think, much clearer on that issue than Warren. She just finally put uh, a health care plan on her website, and I was just looking at it. And if you look at the part that especially disturbs me about that, about mental health care, uh, you know, that makes it sound like that would be separate from whatever sort of Medicare for all thing she's endorsing. She talks about Medicare for all, and then she talks about affordable mental health care. And usually when I hear that word affordable about health care, I start worrying because that's uh, that's kind of the, the buzzword for, you know, it's still in the market system. Uh, you know, we're just going to try to do some sort of cost control thing. So I'm with Ben here. It's confusing. Um, you know, does she mean that she supports single payer for everything but mental health? Is that something where, you know, she would just offer a subsidy? You know, there's no questions like this when it comes to Bernie Sanders. He just supports single payer Medicare for all. That includes mental health care, that includes dental, vision. So there's these open questions about Elizabeth Warren that makes it an obvious choice. If there is a choice between Bernie and Warren and single payer is one of your main issues, you opt for Bernie Sanders. So this is confusing and makes no sense. And to clear up some of the confusion, National Director for the Working Families Party, Maurice Mitchell, appeared on CNN with Chris Cuomo, and he tried to explain why they made this endorsement. But rather than clearing up the confusion, this actually made me feel even more confused. Why Warren and not Sanders? So let me just first say that it's 2019 and we have two structural change, big, bold, progressive candidates that um, have built huge grassroots followings in the democratic process. But you picked one, why? Right, and so our grassroots members and our volunteers and our state committee, we engaged in a very long process and we came out. And I'm so proud of the process and so proud that we chose Elizabeth Warren. And let me tell you why. So, I mean, if you look at her, you know, they joke about she has a plan for it, right? But if you look at it and, and you take a step back, so. Green New Deal, so we could save the planet. Um, a historically big picture uh, housing uh, policy. Um, you know, uh, the Medicare for all to take the insurance companies between you and your doctor, right? So uh, healthcare could be a right and not a commodity that's that's traded. Bernie right? does the same things right. that he wrote the damn bill. That's that's absolutely right. Okay, so. <laughs> This is confusing. The reason why he's happy that the Working Families Party opted to endorse Warren over Bernie Sanders is for the following reasons. One, the Green New Deal, so we can save the planet. Okay, well, how do you reconcile the fact that Bernie Sanders scored higher when it comes to the Green New Deal than Elizabeth Warren? So if you truly want to save the planet and you want the strongest policy proposal, well, you can't really say it's because of Elizabeth Warren's Green New Deal if Bernie's is stronger. He also says uh, Medicare for all. 
take the insurance companies between you and your doctor. So healthcare is a right and not a commodity that's traded. Uh, I don't know what that means to take the insurance companies between you and your doctor, take them out. Is that what do you mean? You want to take them out of the equation? Because we don't necessarily know that that's what Warren is going to do because she only recently endorsed Medicare for All. And she was talking about there being many paths to Medicare for All. And at the end of the day, all Democrats have the same goal when it comes to Medicare for All and healthcare and whatnot. Um, so these are horrible reasons. If the Green New Deal and Medicare for All are your biggest issues, then to support Warren over Sanders is nonsensical. So I don't get it. There's really nothing that we can do about this. They made their endorsement. They're not going to unendorse Elizabeth Warren, but simply we just have to make the case that Bernie Sanders is the stronger candidate. So the entire situation is incredibly frustrating and it just feels like, you know, these people who claim to care about certain policies that claim to stand up for working families, to endorse Crowley, to not endorse Bernie. I mean, what are you doing? I just, it doesn't make any sense to me. And, you know, you can see why they don't have a good reason because when they try to explain it, they're frailing. You know, you could tell that, you know, uh, Mitchell was f uh, frazzled there because if you're trying to explain to people that from the standpoint of you being a progressive, Warren is better than Bernie, you're going to come off as either a troll or someone who isn't very politically savvy because it's evident to anyone who is engaged with politics that Bernie has the strongest ground game. He's the strongest politically. He is more electable to take on Donald Trump because he has that anti-establishment appeal, whereas Elizabeth Warren is getting buddy-buddy with the establishment. And he is just stronger on policies like Medicare for All and the Green New Deal. So I don't know what else to say. Um, this endorsement is completely nonsensical and the Working Families Party has discredited themselves. And, you know, it's not like they only discredited themselves now. I think that when they endorsed Joe Crowley over Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, that in and of itself should have been the red flag that we all needed to see that maybe there's something wrong with this organization. But now to do this, um, it's just, it's, it's a complete joke. So it's been a while, but I want to take some time to talk about Pete Buttigieg. Um, you know, at the beginning of this race, I actually surprisingly praised him because his rhetoric when it comes to progressive issues was actually pretty refreshing. So in an interview with Morning Joe, when the issue of healthcare and Medicare for all came up, he said that it's not a radical idea, contrary to popular belief, and that Medicare for all actually, if you think about it, is the real compromise policy between, you know, a capitalist Obamacare type system and a national health care system like the UK has. So single payer is really the logical choice between those two extremes. And I thought that it was such a phenomenal point to make. And he really did seem to want to appeal to progressives. But fast forward, you know, about six or so months later, and now he's having these private fundraisers in the Hamptons. Now billionaires are flocking to his campaign and contributing, and now he's going out of his way to lie about progressive policy proposals like Medicare for All. And he absolutely needs to be called out because it's one thing to say that, you know, you're not part of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, but to go out of your way and actively spread misinformation, presumably at the behest of special interests, that is uniquely evil. And yes, I'm using the word evil because that's what that is. If you are shilling for a system that allows people to die or go bankrupt because they don't have health insurance, or maybe they have health insurance, but they still can't afford a particular procedure that their insurance company won't cover, that's just pure evil. I don't know what else to say, how to be more charitable with that. So one thing that has really stuck with me, that has really got on, gotten under my skin, and I don't know if I talked about this in my debate analysis video, is what he said about Medicare for All. And this is what he said in response to Bernie Sanders talking about Medicare for All. The, the problem, Senator Sanders, with that damn bill that you wrote that. and that <laughs> Senator Warren backs is that it doesn't trust the American people. I trust you to choose what makes the most sense for you, not my way or the highway. Now, look, 
I think we do have to go far beyond tinkering with the ACA. I propose Medicare for all who want it. We take a version of Medicare, we make it available for the American people, and if we're right as progressives that that public alternative is better, then the American people will figure that out for themselves. I trust the American people to make the right choice for them. Why don't you? Spoken like a true neoliberal nitwit. What he said there is disingenuous horseshit. Because to suggest that eliminating private health insurance companies somehow isn't putting trust in the American people, it's idiotic. And you're framing this in a way that conspicuously benefits the health insurance industry. Because Bernie Sanders has a Medicare for All bill that is so robust that it would effectively get rid of private insurance companies. Because if you ban duplicative care and you offer a comprehensive benefits, you're not leaving any room for these health insurance companies. So what does Pete Buttigieg say to that? Well, you are not trusting the American people to make their choice between a public system and a private system. Why should we remove quote unquote choice from Americans? Why shouldn't we trust them? I trust the American people to make the right choice for them. Why won't you trust them? And that is where I call bullshit on that rhetoric and talking points, because here's the thing. To suggest that wanting to get rid of these for-profit health insurance vultures means we don't trust the Americans to make their own decision is absolutely nonsensical, because of course we trust the American people to make their own decisions when it comes to healthcare. But you see, what he is proposing here is a false dichotomy of choice. It's the illusion of choice, that the choice when it comes to healthcare is between a public or private option. But that's not the choice that we're looking for. The choice comes into play when Americans have the ability to choose whatever doctor they want, to go to whatever hospital they want, because America becomes one big network. Because if I have the choice to see any doctor in the country, that is true choice. That's giving me the freedom to do whatever I want, to take my own health care into my own hands. And that's really what matters. Choosing between private insurance and, you know, a public Medicare system, that's not where the choice comes in. I don't want to worry about that. Do you think that people are excited to fill out the paperwork and pay their monthly health insurance premiums? Of course they're not. So to say Bernie Sanders doesn't trust the American people, as someone who claims he formally supported Medicare for all, now you're just lying. Now you've become the enemy, Pete. Now, another thing that he said, he followed up his attack on Medicare for all, in an interview with CNN, and um, what he said was also nonsensical. Take a look. As the youngest candidate in the field, I am obviously a believer in the power of generational change. I also believe that a candidate at any age, depending who they are, can be a great president. What we've got to talk about right now is vision. My concern about the vision from the Sanders-Warren approach is that uh, it can polarize Americans when we have other ways to deliver bold solutions uh, without dividing the American people further. So that right there shows exactly why he is not positioned to take on Donald Trump. Because what Democrats are failing to realize is that polarization is a reality in American politics. It's an inescapable reality that you have to deal with. Polarization will not be going away anytime soon. So what makes more sense to try to bring those two polarized halves together during the process of an election or actually craft a strategy tailor made for polarization and then once you get elected, try to bring people together by passing popular policy proposals. You see, if you try to pretend like America isn't polarized and that, you know, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are furthering that divide, you're being a useful idiot because we're already polarized. That's not going to change. So capitalize on that polarization and actually show the base that they have a reason to come out and support you because Republicans are so bad. They're already energized to come out and support Donald Trump, okay? He's not trying to appeal to moderate Democrats. He's not appealing to the left in any way, shape, or form. So why should Democrats appeal to moderates that don't really exist anymore in a polarized environment when they could excite the base, go after non-voters, and perhaps win larger than they've ever won before. I mean, think about this. If you're worried about polarization and trying to reach out to moderates, we already saw how that strategy plays out at the national level. It leads to Republicans winning. 
Hillary lost. She tried that. She picked a VP that was to her right when she was already a center-right politician. So what do you want? What are you going after? You honestly think that Medicare for All is polarizing? Then explain why some polls show that a majority of Republicans support it. Explain why it's overwhelmingly popular with the Democratic Party base. See, I'm preaching to the choir. Pete Buttigieg is smart enough to know that everything I'm saying is true, but he's choosing to lie and be disingenuous because this is a political tactic. You see, when you start going down in the polls and you kind of lose that status as being one of the front runners, what you have to do in electoral strategy is to attack the front runner. It makes sense, so I get it. But you see, if he wants to criticize Bernie Sanders, you can do that in a way where you're not lying about Medicare for all, because Bernie Sanders is not above criticism. I personally have criticisms of Bernie Sanders from the left. The problem, though, is that Pete Buttigieg is a centrist. He is to the right of Bernie Sanders. So he can't actually come across as a progressive and criticize Bernie Sanders from the left because he is to Bernie Sanders' right. So what does he do? What everyone else does. He lies about Bernie Sanders' policies. And that doesn't just hurt Bernie. That hurts everyone. That hurts grassroots activists who have been fighting for Medicare for All for years. So shame on Pete Buttigieg. This individual is disgusting. He is a disgrace to American politics. And really, he should be ashamed of himself. But like all of his predecessors, Obama, Hillary Clinton... He's proving that he doesn't actually care about policy. He's hollow, he's vapid, and he just cares about his own career. He's not fighting for the people. He's looking out for himself. He's an opportunist, and that's why he's in the race, period. Every time I talk about how bad Bill Maher has gotten, it's like he takes this as a challenge, and I absolutely am not under the illusion that he's watching my show, but it's like he keeps devolving, and just when you think that you know, he's bottomed out. He can't get any worse than this. He really says something even dumber than anyone could fathom that he would be saying. I mean, five years ago, to hear the way he talks about politics and Bernie Sanders and progressive policies, I wouldn't have believed that that's the same person. But here we are. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm just going to play the clip for you. Um, when he says something very stupid, watch one of the panelists face. Can I present a scenario? I think this might be one of those years where it's the, as the discussion Mike and I were having. It's that they can't get over that centrist versus socialist thing. So Elizabeth Warren at some point takes Bernie's voters. He drops out. It's Warren and Biden. But and they go to the convention and it's deadlocked. This has happened before in American yeah. politics and they need a compromise candidate. I'm looking hard at Amy Klobuchar. You yeah. know why? Because, like... This is not an insult, Amy Klobuchar. I like you, but when they put generic Democrat on yeah. the ballot, they win. So you don't have you, a. But you know, Bill, she's a woman, Bill, so like that you know helps. That wins? moves a lot hold with on the a West, a a wokesters, and then she's. Why a do you think that economic populism, whatever you want to call it, socialism, democratic socialism, etc., Medicare for all, is so unpopular when a poll just came out that had Bernie Sanders beating Trump in Texas by more than any of the other candidates. The last 20 polls have shown Bernie Sanders beating Trump. And here's the other thing, though. Meaning? Meaning that you don't need a centrist to win. Centrism is why we have lost. It's why we lost well, a thousand state house yeah. seats. It's why we lost the White House. We ran a centrist. But, but, we lost. But, but even the centrists in the Democratic Party are pretty far left. <laughs> <laughs> So the look on Crystal Ball's face, I think <laughs> she really represented how we all felt watching him make that idiotic point. I mean, there's like multiple layers to why that's not just a bad idea, but it's downright stupid. So first of all, let's say hypothetically speaking, this scenario plays out where it comes down to Biden and Warren and they're deadlocked. First of all, he is actually saying, rather than going for the top two choices in this hypothetical scenario, we should go with the candidate who's polling at like 2% instead. That is an absolutely moronic thing to say in and of itself because it's antithetical to democracy. That would be superdelegates openly choosing whoever they want unilaterally. Do you not think that that would demoralize the base, Bill? Second of all, to say that Amy Klobuchar, of all people, is the compromise candidate between Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren shows that he just doesn't care about 
policy at all because she is the female Joe Biden. So in what way does she embody any of the principles that Bernie Sanders and even Elizabeth Warren are espousing? In what way? What does she even stand for? Bill, can you name a single policy that sets her apart from Joe Biden? Can you name one? Because she's not talking about policies. She is pitching herself as, well, I was going to say a moderate, but she actually self-identifies as a progressive still, hilariously enough. But, you know, in the same vein as Hillary, she is basically saying, I'm a progressive who's practical and I like to get things done. And that's good enough for Bill. Because she self-identifies as a progressive, even if she is politically moderate, that's good enough for Bill to say, you know what, she's a compromise candidate. I mean, I don't know what else to say. Bill Maher used to be someone who offered unique political insight, and now he is one of the worst pundits. In fact, I don't know if he's one of the worst, or just that, you know, he fell so far, right? Because everyone on mainstream news... They say idiotic things, they, you know, they do apologia for the Democratic Party establishment and the political elite class, but Bill Maher, he was really different, you know, he supported Bernie in 2016, even if he was very dismissive of Bernie's chances, but now it's just like, he's full mask off and he seems to have contempt for Bernie Sanders, he hasn't even brought Bernie Sanders back since he, you know, announced that he's running again, and unless I'm forgetting, you know, an appearance, but I mean, it's just, it's embarrassing. And Crystal Ball brought up the point that I would have absolutely brought up. She said, we don't need a centrist to win. Centrism is why Democrats have lost more than a thousand seats in state legislatures across the country. How do you not grasp this yet, Bill? How do you not grasp this? And I'm so glad that Crystal Ball was on the panel to make that point and push back, because Bill Maher, Oftentimes, he surrounds himself with Republicans and corporate Democrats and Democratic Party strategists who think the same way. They're all in that same bubble, so they aren't, you know, as likely to push back. But Crystal Ball, thankfully, was there to point out how dumb of a strategy that was. But then how does he respond to Crystal Ball? He says even centrists in the Democratic Party are far left. I don't even know what to say to that. His perception of the Overton window from the standpoint of someone who used to be progressive is far right. It's right wingers who think that centrist Democrats are far left. But in actuality, when you compare the Democratic Party to the average left wing party anywhere in Europe or throughout the world in Latin America, they are to the right. There are probably more similarities between uh, the conservative UK party and Democrats than there are between Republicans and Tories. Maybe that's not necessarily the case now with Boris Johnson as prime minister. But still, when you compare them to average left-wing parties, they are far to the right. And basically the way that the Overton window is sitting in the United States is we have two right-wing parties. One is a far-right party, an extremist party, the Republican Party, that is, you know, more aligned with UKIP and these fringe right-wing parties you see in uh, Europe than they are with any normal conservative party. And then we have a center-right party or a centrist at best in Democrats. Now, thankfully, there's been an effort to push that Overton window back to the left, but that's still, you know, <laughs> the overwhelming majority of Democrats they are very much centrist to center right. I mean, Chris Coons was on Fox News talking about how maybe we would be justified if we uh, bombed Iran, if they really were culpable for this Saudi oil attack. I mean, in what world are centrist Democrats far left? You honestly think that Joe Manchin is a far leftist, Bill? I mean, the things that he says, it's, it's baffling to think that he believes it after you listen to him just from like, what, five to six years ago. It was him who was saying we need a left-wing equivalent of the Tea Party. And now he's saying the complete opposite. Now he's saying, you know, anyone who's a far leftist who's too pure, they can go fuck themselves with a locally grown organic cucumber. After he said, no, we really need a left-wing Tea Party. The man is an absolute fraud and a joke. And I don't know how anyone can still take him seriously, but his platform is large enough to where people do take him seriously. So I do think it's incumbent on us in indie media to push back against what he says. 
because I hate myself, I am doing a second Bill Maher video in the same week. Um, <laughs> not necessarily something that I think uh, is probably a good idea, but nonetheless, here we are. So as you all know, he brought on Crystal Ball to push back against this idiocy, but he also brought on filmmaker Michael Moore. And, you know, Michael Moore, my feelings on him are mixed, but mostly positive. Michael Moore, for the most part, he still, he seems to have his finger on the pulse more so than other elites. But I will say that there have been times where he's had takes that are questionable to say the least so i want to say maybe it was in march of this year on instagram he made a post where he floated a celebrity for president and i'm blanking on the celebrity but i believe it was someone like tom hanks this is the person who can uh, rally the democratic party base someone who's beloved by the american public so i don't remember who it was specifically but i know that it was a very weird take with that being said, Michael Moore still has a lot of great things to say, and I think that he does make a contribution to the progressive movement that is, for the most part, valuable, even if at times he kind of veers off in a weird direction. But on Bill Maher's show, he actually decided to challenge Bill Maher and push back against Bill Maher's newfangled uh, centrism. And this was really interesting to watch. You and I have fought for years. To, to get the country where it is now. The majority of the, you talked about climate change 20 years ago. You talked yeah. about so many things, the, uh, legalizing marijuana, the fact that that's just right. happening in one state after another now. You were ahead of the curve for so many years. Religion we fought itself, for yeah. these things. <laughs> no, we fought for these things. <laughs> you, yeah. the minimum right. wage. I'll tell you what Bill Maher believes in. The minimum wage should yes, not be seven twenty-five an hour. No, of the, course go not. Go down the whole list. Okay. Women should be paid the but, same but, as men for doing let's the same the job. Okay, but let's we go. got the country to okay. where Bill Maher and I, Michael Moore are at. Okay. Why pull back now, Bill, because and the, say we've got to go to the center because, because, to be safe? Because the we country isn't safe. there. Because I'm sorry, you're lumping a lot of uh, vague shit together. The country is for raising the minimum wage, of course. The country is not for Medicare for all. As, as soon as you ask the question, get rid of private health insurance. I mean, I mean, Barack Obama said, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor, mm -hmm. which turned right. out to be not true for only 2% of the population, and the whole country went apeshit about the 2%. Right. Now are you going to take away everybody's? Well, Completely every get rid of shows, private? Even though there were so many things to fix about Obama. They don't like that. that. People don't like that. No, they like the fact that their 26-year-old can still be covered, not That's have to worry about. That's Obamacare. That's, Ob That's Obamacare. Saying, oh, they like the things about Obamacare, but, right. but it didn't go far enough. And, and we've got 30 million people that are uninsured. Okay. We've got 50 more but million as, as Nancy, that are underinsured. That, that is the As Nancy sad... Pelosi points out, Obamacare is a better benefit. The Medicare for all doesn't play for, pay for catastrophic. You've got to do that yourself. Look, Bill, we're going to beat Trump. We're going to beat Trump. Well, that's not that's, a helpful you know, thing to say. No, it is. No, as I'm you, not, I'm not know, predicting it. We're, I know. No, no, I, no. You're the, guy, about this. you're the two guys. We're the two guys we're, who said Trump was going to win. And I'll say, so, if the election were okay, tonight, so if the election were tonight, Trump would win. How wow. about that? Ooh. All right. That's how dangerous it is because everybody is so. See, look at the same reaction when I said that three years ago. Yeah. No, no, right. don't say that. You have to respect the evil genius of okay. this guy. And yes, how he gets I, exactly. away with every right. fucking thing. Okay, so listen, here's an interesting thing. He will get I away only... with this if we don't, I... you and I and others, start fighting. Fighting for the progressive okay. things that we believe he... in. So that goes on longer, and let me just say that Bill Maher, I mean, I don't even know what to say. After that clip, he went on to criticize members of the squad and say that their approval rating is low and that America doesn't like them and that if Donald Trump actually makes them the face of the Democratic Party, then this will be bad for Democrats. See, the problem with Bill Maher is that he only views politics through the uh, lens of personality. It's all about the personalities. And first of all, he doesn't mention that their approval rating is maybe low because Fox News has been relentless in attacking these ladies. But to him, it's all about personality. The policies that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ilhan Omar and what they're talking about, that doesn't matter. It's their personalities. And since Fox News says that they're bad, then, you know, um, they must be bad. So he's just an imbecile. But basically, the point that Michael Moore made, which I think was poignant, was that why now, all of a sudden, after being a progressive, you're saying, wait, pump the brakes. I mean, we finally get this vocal left-wing movement in the country, which is what we needed, which is what you previously said we need. And now, all of a sudden, you're against them. You're shitting on them. Why? 
And Bill Maher's response, idiotically enough, was, it's not where the country's at. Really? We elected Donald Trump. The establishment has failed Americans. They're ready for change. They're ready for bold progressivism. And if you look at countries throughout the world, in every country where there is a Trumpian figure, Brazil, the UK, there is always someone who is progressive, who is incredibly popular. Left-wing policies, vocal, social democratic and socialist policies are the antidote to fascism and right-wing populism. That's the only thing that actually can permanently defeat Donald Trump, okay? So the fact that Bill Maher doesn't get that by now, it shows how naive he is and how he's just not engaged. And what's odd to me is the prime example he brings up to show why Americans aren't with progressives. Medicare for all. He says Americans don't support Medicare for all. They don't support Medicare for all. Have you read any poll lately, Bill? Any poll. Most polls show that Medicare for all is overwhelmingly popular. And some polls even show that a majority of Republicans support it. But he goes on to lie about Medicare for all and frames it as taking away health care. So that's why it's not popular. Obama said, if you like your doctor, you can keep it. And now we're going to take, you know, insurance away. You know, it's interesting to me that all of these people, they just, one person will say it and then everyone else will repeat it. It's like a telephone, but for corporate talking points. Now, I don't believe that Bill Maher is meeting, you know, in a smoke-filled back room with the Democratic Party strategists so that way they can all get on the same page and say the same thing. But, you know, it's just, it shows you that his level of political analysis is very superficial. He just parrots what he hears on the mainstream media. That's it. That's all, you know, he does. That's the extent of research that he performs. Research, if you even want to call it that. Medicare for All is incredibly popular. And if you look at this poll from the Morning Consult, if you explain to people that even if we take away their private health insurance but replace it with Medicare for All where they get to still see their doctors and go to the hospitals that they want, it's still is popular. So for you to say Medicare for all is not where the American people are, that's laughable. Look at all the policies that Bernie Sanders is proposing and they have majority support. Raising the minimum wage, Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, a federal jobs guarantee. The writing is on the wall. Bernie Sanders is the candidate that can basically defeat Donald Trump and put us on the trajectory of social democracy. But to Bill Maher, he probably buys into all of this fear-mongering that he sees in the mainstream news. He just thinks, well, you know, if you run a far-left candidate, Donald Trump is going to pounce and we're going to lose. And, you know, having Trump for another four years, that wouldn't make me feel good. I mean, look, Donald Trump and the Republican Party, they can move as far to the right as they want. But the minute that people on the left start inching closer towards social democracy, that's when people on the supposed left say, hang on now, pump the brakes. It's a double standard. Republicans can become as extreme as they want to be. Move off a cliff and it doesn't matter. Nobody's really uh, calling them out for that, including liberals. But when leftists say, hey, you know what? Maybe we should have a healthcare system that's comparable to our neighbors just north of the border. Maybe we should actually pay our workers a living wage so that way we reduce poverty. We actually have a middle class again. That's when we are the ones that are scolded. It's just, it's irritating. And I can't stand Bill Maher. And he has permanently damaged his credibility here. So I, I think that at this point, Bill Maher is just too far gone. I don't think that anything would make him see the light. I mean, Bernie Sanders, even if he were elected and Jeremy Corbyn was elected and Lula was freed and throughout the world, social Democrats are introducing these policies that are changing people's lives for the better and restoring faith in, you know, the political establishment, he still would probably find some reason to shit on them. The man's an idiot. He... He's out of touch, and I think that that's evident. Uh, I'm just glad that he's still at least open to bring on people like Michael Moore and Crystal Ball who are willing to challenge him because I guess that's the best that we can hope for when you have someone who is this out of touch. At the Revolt Summit, right-wing grifter Candace Owens got into a pretty heated debate with ATL-based rapper T.I. about Make America Great Again and what that means to her. So he asked her a very simple question. What era in America would you prefer to go back to? And as you're going to see here, it got pretty heated and she didn't have an answer. 
the fear that Trump has lifted in poor whites yeah. that black people and poor yeah. urban people are their problem. Right. What, when and did so, Trump ever say that? That's, see, that's, a, that's a fallacy. When did Trump ever say black people are Make the problem? Make America great again. That's when he said it. Guys, that but was But I'm Ron not on the panel. That so was I Ronald make sure. Reagan's slogan. Was that racist when Ronald Slagan had it as a slogan? Yes, what time? It was. Yes, let me ask oh, you. Oh, so that's, Whoa, that please slogan answer this. is racist. Please answer this. I have a question. So, I have a question. So wait, please, wait, wait. Tip, please just tip, allow me this one outburst. Please. I have a question. When you say make America great again, which period are we talking about? The period when women couldn't vote? The period when we were hanging from trees? I'll answer. Or, or, or like the crack era? Which period in America are you trying to I, make America I would, like again? So I, I actually think that I would, I would totally rock a hat right now that said make black America great again. Because black no, America, make America before, we're talking about make America. Hat, America. That wasn't no, the question. I, answer, I am answering which your question. Which period was America great that we're trying to replicate? Well, I, which era was it? Tell me. I think I'll answer your question. Tell I'm me. I'm ready to answer your question. Which era was it? What? Which era was so great? You, here's the thing that you guys are forgetting. America was actually one of the first. Slavery was all over the world. The all question. over the world. America Man, was, I'm not, I'm not saying it's okay, so why are you saying, oh? Amen. America I was one of the first like countries. I want to like you question, so bad. I'm trying to answer your so question. Smart. I want right, to like you so much. I can't answer the I question. Hear you. I want to be able to hear them. If, 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 I want to be able to hear them. If I can't answer the question and you're just going to boo when I say a slavery was all over the world, which is a fact, why are you booing a fact? Finish because you're point. making light of no, I'm not. You're making light I of haven't the enslavement into I'm not making... of people that look like us. You can't All make right. light of that. That ain't nothing you breeze over. I haven't even over. finished the sentence. How am I making you light of anything? You started with some bullshit. Okay. No. So. Candace, we can, Candace, hold on, wait, 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 wait. We wait. can be emotional, so, Candace, we can wait, wait, boo, wait, no, you no, can no, cheer, no, on, but I'm on, telling on, you right on. now, the black Candace, vote is not going to matter. So, my, so that was um, thoroughly entertaining, and my favorite part was when she invoked Ronald Reagan as kind of a get-out-of-jail-free card to kind of, um, you know, cleanse Trump of his racism because he is just adopting a slogan that Ronald Reagan previously had. So the question was, are you going to say that Ronald Reagan is racist too? And the answer very simply was, yeah, that's easy. Of course he was racist. He was one of the most racist presidents, you could argue. He was the individual who invented the term welfare queens about black women, to fearmonger about black women. So it just shows you how ignorant she is of history, but this is kind of what she does. She isn't just a historical, but she will deny historical facts. She said that the Southern strategy wasn't a thing. She said this in a testimony before Congress. She literally said that with a straight face. This is someone who has no moral core. She is just in it for the check. That's evident because she can't come up with arguments to explain why it's good for black Americans to support Donald Trump. And she's the ind individual who spearheaded this Blexit movement where she's making the case that if you are a black American, then it would behoove you to support Donald Trump. But most black Americans rightfully do not support Donald Trump because his policies are a disaster for them. The Republican Party is absolutely destructive to black Americans. But she's saying that, you know, it's the conservatives and the Republican Party now, the modern Republican Party, that's actually better for black America than Democrats. I mean, it's a joke, but when it comes to the question as of what era do you want to replicate, this is a question that I've always wanted to ask Trump supporters, because if the slogan is make America great again, the implication is that it was once great and it's no longer great. So the idea is there must be an era in time, if you had a time machine, that you'd want to return to, a status quo that was preferable to what we have now. And T.I. asked the question, what era do you want to replicate? Because the underlying assumption here is that if you're a black American, especially, why would you want to go back to any point in time? Because throughout the history of this country, it has not been kind to black Americans. It has not been kind to women. It has not been kind to poor people. It has not been kind to the LGBTQ plus community. It's still not kind to these groups, but obviously, Things have gotten better. There's still systemic racism, institutional racism, social discrimination. There's all of these issues, police brutality against marginalized minorities. But 
to go backwards would make individuals from these groups who are vulnerable much, much worse. So to suggest that maybe we should go back to a different era, it really doesn't make sense. It seems like it's contrary to your own self-interest to support this idea. So the question that TI asked is simple. Where do you want to go back to, Candace? What era in US history would be better for you? Because it doesn't really seem like there's any era that would be preferable. So what are you talking about? And see, this is the thing about the MAGA slogan and why it was so persuasive and why it resonated with a lot of people because it's a blank slate. Trump isn't saying, let's go back to 1969. Let's go back to 1973. He's just saying, make America great again. So individuals who support Donald Trump can kind of insert whatever they want there. They simply attribute whatever meaning they want to that slogan. So that's why Make America Great Again was a slogan that resonated with a lot of people. Now, of course, I'm overgeneralizing here, but this is something that as a Trump supporter, she should be ready to answer. But the fact that she couldn't shows that she's in this for the money. It's all about the paycheck. Well, I am back after taking a week off and I return to the world of political commentary with a gigantic ball in the pit of my stomach and an overwhelming sense of dread because once again, we are facing the prospect of a potential war or strike, definitely some sort of escalation with Iran. And this comes after the news that John Bolton either was fired or resigned, which of course, in a lot of our eyes, diminished the prospect of war because John Bolton was openly a hawk on Iran. He wanted to overthrow the Iranian regime by 2019. So it was evident that getting rid of John Bolton made the prospect of war with Iran less likely. Now, his ouster reportedly happened after he clashed with Donald Trump over policy with regard to Iran. So Trump vocalized his intent to lift some sanctions on Iran in hopes that that would bring Tehran back to the table after he torpedoed the Iran deal. But of course, John Bolton didn't like that and he tried to persuade Donald Trump that de-escalation wasn't actually the right course of action. And then this clash led to the ouster of John Bolton. So it seemed like everything was going semi-smoothly until you fast forward to Saturday when there were drone attacks on two Saudi oil fields and Houthi rebels claimed responsibility. And this led to a disruption of almost half of Saudi Arabia's oil exports. And when you consider the fact that Saudi Arabia produces a tenth of crude oil globally, I mean, the ramifications for this are huge. The moment I found out that this happened, I thought, this could be what leads us to war with Iran if it is the case that the United States blames Iran for this. And of course, that's exactly what they are doing, even after Houthi rebels have claimed responsibility for this attack. Now, the dust has kind of settled and we see the impact that this is having on global markets. Ultimately, this led to the biggest spike in oil prices within the last decade. And here in the United States, we love our oil. So, I mean, you can murder journalists, you can commit genocide, we're not gonna touch you. But if you fuck with our oil, that's when we all have to be worried about the prospect of war. And I'm not even gonna worry about cursing. This video will in fact be demonetized. So, you know, it's frustrating. This situation is absolutely terrifying. Houthi rebels claimed responsibility. And to give you some additional context, they're saying, look, we will do further attacks if Saudi Arabia does not withdraw because Saudi Arabia has now been waging a years long genocide in Yemen. And I don't think that it's hyperbolic to describe what Saudi Arabia is doing as a genocide. So they're saying this is in direct retaliation to what Saudi Arabia has been doing in Yemen. And there will be more attacks if they don't stop doing what they're doing in Yemen. Now, of course, it is possible that Iran had something to do with this in some way. Perhaps they supplied, you know, uh, the Houthi rebels with the drones or weapons, assistance in some way. But what we all knew and expected would happen is exactly what happened. You know, Iran is the main scapegoat. Secretary of State and Iran hawk Mike Pompeo is in fact blaming Iran even after the Houthis took responsibility and Iran itself has denied any part. And again, I'm not trying to deny 
whether or not Iran assisted the Houthis here. What I'm trying to do is make the case that even in the event Iran did this, let's say hypothetically speaking, that Iran directly was responsible and claimed responsibility for this attack, that still is not a justification for the United States to strike or invade Iran. Because that is absolutely something that could lead to not just a bloody war with Iran, but World War III potentially. So we, of course, should not go to war with them over oil. But the United States does have a long history of intervening when oil is at stake. If we want oil or oil is, you know, at risk, we intervene. Now, after this attack happened, Donald Trump tweeted, Saudi Arabia oil supply was attacked. There is reason to believe that we know the culprit are locked and loaded depending on verification, but are waiting to hear from the kingdom as to who they believe was the cause of this attack and under what terms we would proceed. So this is another threat to a country via Twitter by Donald Trump. And we're just waiting on Saudi Arabia to give us the go ahead. Say it's Iran and we'll do what you want, Saudi Arabia. Unbelievable. Now, what Donald Trump is alluding to here when he says that we're locked and lo loaded, presumably, is him saying we are ready to strike in the event Iran is responsible. If that's what the intelligence points us towards, we'll strike Iran. So, in his view, he wants to do something to make sure that he projects strength. He doesn't want to be seen as, you know, this beta male. He doesn't want to appear too weak as he thinks Obama appeared. But... At the same time, he is committed to at least being portrayed as a non-interventionist. When that's laughable, he's not. He is a warmonger, perhaps to a lesser extent than individuals like Mike Pompeo or John Bolton, but nonetheless, he still is a warmonger. But he still wants to be portrayed as an anti-interventionist. So it seems like, in his view, he thinks striking Iran will suffice, and then he pulls out. No war needed after that. The problem is that Iran has communicated that they would, in fact, view that as an act of war, and that that would lead to war. But let's talk a little bit more about that after we hear from Donald Trump when he denied that war with Iran is what he wants. Take a look. And I will tell you that was a very large attack and it could be met with an attack many, many times larger very easily by our country. But we're going to find out who definitively did it first. Can we clarify, Mr. President, so you said that you think that Iran is responsible for the attack. Do you think that I, I didn't attack, say that. I, why do you, you say that? that? I said, said that, that we think we know who it was, but I didn't say anybody. But you, you uh, certainly it would look to most like it was Iran, but I did not say it the way you said. Do I want war? I don't want war with anybody. I'm somebody that would like not to have war. We have the strongest military in the world. We've spent more than a trillion and a half dollars in the last short period of time on our military. Nobody's even come close. There's nobody that has the F-35. We have the best fighter jets, the best rockets, the best missiles, the best equipment. Uh, but with all of that being said, we'd certainly like to avoid it. Two and a half to three years ago, they were causing a lot of trouble, and we'll see what happens. But uh, we'll let you know definitively, or there, as you know, there are ways to uh, see definitively where they came from, and we have all of those ways, and that's being checked out right now. Well, you know, there were always conditions, because the conditions, if you look at it, the sanctions are not going to be taken off. So if the sanctions, that's a condition. So, you know, that's why the press misreported it. Uh, the biggest thing you can talk about are the sanctions, and the sanctions are massive. There's never been sanctions put on a country like that, and I think they have a tremendous future, but not the way they're behaving. We'll see what happens in terms of this attack. Uh, Secretary Pompeo and others will be going over to Saudi Arabia at some point to discuss what they feel they're going to make a statement fairly soon. Uh, but they also know something that most people don't know as to where it came from, who did it, and we'll be able to find that out and figure that out very quickly. We pretty much already know. You know, there's a number of ways that you can interpret what Donald Trump is saying there. Um, by saying, I don't want war with Iran, it seems like he thinks a strike in the same way that he struck Syria twice would basically be all that happens. But again, Iran has made it very clear that they are prepared to go to war if they are struck. Now, if we were attacked, let's say Iran bombed Texas, would we just let that go? 
absolutely not. We would absolutely be prepared for war, not to be redundant and overuse the word absolutely. But when we're talking about Donald Trump, we are dealing in absolutes because this individual is incredibly volatile. He's unstable. And one minute he could talk about how locked and loaded we are and the next minute talk about how, of course, I don't want war with Iran. But make no mistake about it. If he strikes them, that's war with Iran. That is an act of war, unquestionably. So we don't necessarily know how this is going to turn out. We're watching this unfold in real time and de-escalation seems a lot less likely this time around because we see an attack on Saudi Arabia, which is one of our allies, and the United States government is committed to defending our allies, especially if we already are looking for reasons to attack Iran. So any little thing that they do or don't do is the justification that we need to invade. We can't just invade if we have no reason to. So whether we fabricate a reason or take something and attribute blame to Iran for, even if it's someone else, it doesn't matter. The point is there are many neocons in Donald Trump's administration, the military industrial complex does have an overwhelming amount of influence over a lot of lawmakers and they want war with Iran because that is incredibly profitable. So we are trying to push back against the prospect of war with Iran within a capitalist system that profits off of never ending wars. And the situation looks grim. I'll just put it that way. Now, in response to Donald Trump's saber rattling, you do have the usual anti-war voices speaking out. You had Tulsi Gabbard on Twitter say Trump awaits instructions from Saudi masters. Having our country act as Saudi Arabia's bitch is not America first. Rand Paul explained how a strike on Iran would be a quote big mistake, which is a message that he sent to Donald Trump after Lindsey Graham unsurprisingly told Donald Trump that he must consider an attack on Iran. And Lindsey Graham, I don't think that there's any war that he's ever been against. Like, you literally could say, should we strike Canada? And if that is something that would increase the profits of his donors in the military industrial complex, in that defense industry, he would go for it. This man is a psychopath. He is not stable. So I'm glad that there are a few anti-war voices, even within, you know, uh, at least one in the Republican Party, in Rand Paul, who's willing to push back. However, the problem is that we've gotten to this point where never-ending wars is just the default position and new wars aren't that alarming to people. There's this emerging bipartisan consensus when it comes to war. And to give you an example of that, Chris Coons, United States Senator in the Democratic Party, had this to say on Fox News. Quote, we have been constantly preparing ourselves for a full-fledged war. Democratic Senator Chris Coons sits on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He's a busy guy, a lot of topics. Senator, great to see you in person. Great to see you. Senator, uh, if it is tied directly to Iran, mm -hmm. what's appropriate action? Uh, well, first, I want to see I want to see the intelligence. Um, but it seems credible that the Houthis uh, don't have the sort of advanced drones that carried out this crippling strike on Saudi oil facilities. Uh, my hope is that the president will consult uh, with his generals, his diplomats, his advisors will look hard at the intelligence. Iran is one of the, the most dangerous um, state sponsors of terrorism. Um, this may well be the thing that calls for military action against Iran if that's what the intelligence supports. What about people who say, you know, we got our own oil, we don't need that oil as much as we used to, not our problem. What would you say to that? Um, I'd say one of the things that has kept America safe and secure for seven decades is a global network of alliances. Obviously, our alliance with the Saudis has been badly strained uh, by the murder of Khashoggi and by some of the other things that uh, MBS, the crown prince, has done. Um, but this is a moment where Iran is really pushing our resolve and is really testing to see whether we're actually going to stand up. And if there's attacks by Iran on our close allies like Jordan, Israel, or the Saudis, um, we need to take seriously taking action against and I Iran. think it would be great to know that uh, Republicans and uh, Democrats would be uh, behind that. So if the intelligence says that, you know, Iran is responsible, that's a justification to attack Iran. So here's what I will say about this, because I, I don't know what's going to come of all of this. Maybe Trump will try to deescalate. Maybe someone like Tucker Carlson will once again get in his ear. We don't know what's going to happen, but there are two conflicting sides here. You have one side that's overwhelmingly powerful, 
urging and trying to go Donald Trump into war with Iran, knowing that Donald Trump is belligerent and volatile enough to where he could potentially act if the right person says something at the right time. You know, they're trying to use that to their advantage. And then you have the anti-war side, which is small in comparison, trying to do whatever they can to put pressure on lawmakers to put pressure on Donald Trump. The problem is that, you know, as these things continue to happen, we had the incident a couple of months ago, you know, it seems as if what we're watching is a case being built against Iran. So in the event we're able to escape war with Iran or a strike against Iran uh, in retaliation to this, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're out of the woods yet, because Bolton may be gone, but that military-industrial complex, it operates autonomously. It doesn't need John Bolton in Donald Trump's ear to have a substantial influence over Donald Trump. So even if we don't have a strike on Iran, that doesn't mean that we get to rest easily. We still have to be hyper-vigilant, because Donald Trump is someone who is very unpredictable. Again, he threatened Iran and then says, I don't want war with them. So he's sending mixed messages and he's not playing four-dimensional chess. This is not someone who has some type of complex strategy and he's just, you know, trying to convey strength to Iran. This is someone who has no strategy. So that type of naivete and just downright dumb fuckery is easy to capitalize on if you are close to Donald Trump. And Mike Pompeo, he's a hawk on Iran. He wants war with Iran. So we just have to watch the situation and hope for the best, but unfortunately we are going to have to prepare for the worst. Because if anyone's going to attack Iran, Donald Trump, in spite of his anti-interventionist rhetoric, is someone who could potentially be crazy enough to do something like that. So I've got to be honest with you, last week when I was on my staycation, I wasn't filming to watch Tulsi Gabbard go on the Rubin Report and not push back against his right-wing framing of questions, and to not only not push back, but proceed to agree with the way he framed it, that kind of hurt my heart a little bit. I'll be honest. The Democrats are basically trying to outdo each other for open borders, something like that. Um, a, do you think that's a fair way to start the question? My brain is still in recovery mode from taking in so many high-level and B, where, where do you say that? Now, I was going to talk about that, but Kyle Kalinske, my brother from another mother, actually did a really fair job covering that. So I will link you to his video there. I think that pretty much everything he said, I agree with. But let me say this. Tulsi did make it up to me in a way because she went on Fox News and she was interviewed by Neil Cavuto and she absolutely demonstrated that she is not afraid to push back. I don't know why she didn't push back on the Rubin Report, but here she pushed back. And I think this is more important because if you go on Fox News, you are reaching a broader audience. So you need to be ready to push back against any right wing framing, against any misinformation and right wing Republican Party talking points and propaganda. And she did just that. That. Now, in this interview that I'm about to show you, she was very critical of Donald Trump's response with regard to the issue of Iran, and she said things that were probably really uncomfortable for Fox News' audience to hear, hence why the video has more dislikes than likes, because, you know, how dare she criticize Daddy Trump on his home turf? Fox News is supposed to be, you know, a safe space, so how dare this outsider, this intruder, come into our domain and criticize Lord Donald Trump. So, you know, it's good that she said this because Fox News viewers, they are in a bubble and we're all in political bubbles, you know, in one way or another, but they are in the biggest, most thickest bubble that is very, very difficult to penetrate. And oftentimes you don't reach these viewers unless you go on their own home turf. So what she did in this first clip, I'm going to show you, there's two clips in total, but I'll link you to the full video. She basically educated Fox News viewers about the Iran deal and why it was a net good and why ultimately this is something that fostered peace and why because it's now gone, we are dealing with the current situation and the escalation with Iran. It's because Donald Trump tanked the Iran deal. Take a look. We need to re-enter the Iran nuclear agreement and get rid of these crippling economic sanctions that are continuing to escalate this war against Iran. 
Well, Iran has been doing this kind of stuff with or without sanctions, right? With or without a deal, right? So it doesn't seem to matter uh, the that, occasion or the deal, right? Well, They're well, provocative while the Iran, behavior well, the and the Iran nuclear deal, right? While the Iran nuclear deal was in place, uh, Iran was found to be in compliance, both by our own intelligence agencies, the IAEA, other countries' intelligence agencies. They were complying with that deal, and it was making it so that they were not moving forward towards building a nuclear weapon. Now that that deal has been thrown in the trash, Iran is continuing to move forward. Well, the nuclear deal notwithstanding, they have always been provocative, right? So I guess what I would ask you, would you as president then ignore that provocation deal or no deal? Would you work on behalf with the Saudis? Do you, do you like the Saudis more or less than Iran? What? <laughs> it's not about who you like or who you don't like. It's just about, once again, focusing on our objective of keeping the American people safe. Uh, what has just happened and transpired over the last few days here didn't just pop up out of nowhere. So we can't look at this in isolation away from what has been happening over the last several months that really was kicked off by President Trump uh, walking away from and throwing that nuclear deal in the trash, uh, increasing uh, crippling economic sanctions that are really hurting the people of Iran, most of all, uh, designating their, their military as a terrorist organization, deploying more of our troops to the region. So there's a number of things that have pushed us all the world to this point where we are today she said exactly what fox news viewers needed to hear what we need to do is stop escalating stop being aggressive and actually opt for diplomacy it's a crazy thing you know donald trump is vying for diplomacy with kim jong-un and i think rightfully so so to suggest that he should be more hawkish and aggressive when it comes to iran that's nonsensical if you want to be consistent in your foreign policy. So, you know, for her to say we need to stop with the aggression, lift the sanctions, re-enter the Iran deal, that's exactly what we need to do. Now, uh, Cavuto then says that Iran's behavior continues to be provocative. So, you know, regardless if we have sanctions or not, you know, they're still going to be aggressive. But she corrected him and she said something very important and I'm going to read back her quote. When the Iran nuclear deal was in place, Iran was found to be in compliance, both by our own intelligence agencies, the IAEA, other countries' intelligence agencies. They were complying with that deal, and it was making it so they were not moving forward with building a nuclear weapon. Now, this is so crucial, because the Fox News audience, they've probably never heard this. If you were a Fox News viewer and you've drunk the Kool-Aid and you've watched Fox News religiously for years, you've heard nothing but bad things about the Iran deal, that it makes it easier for them to get a nuke and that they violated the deal multiple times. But in actuality, that's factually incorrect. They were in compliance and we were the ones that violated the deal. So if you want peace, if you want them to be less likely to get a nuclear weapon, if you even want to, you know, agree that that's what they want, then um, you have to understand that we are the ones who are responsible. Donald Trump is responsible. Had he not withdrew from the Iran deal, then we would not be in this predicament. But because Obama did it, it's just automatically bad. And that's what Tulsi Gabbard was trying to explain to Fox News viewers. But Neil Cavuto, he kind of took a cheap shot at Tulsi Gabbard by insinuating that, you know, maybe she loves the Saudis more than the Iranians. And that's why she's saying this. Um, that wasn't the first time he said that. And you're going to see in this next clip that he's going to bring that up again and again, that there must be some underlying thing that's motivating Tulsi Gabbard. You know, she just, she loves the Iranians and maybe that's why she is taking the stand. But she does a really good job, I think, at shutting that notion down and once again, educating Fox News viewers about what's at stake and why we are seeing the situation get so tense. Is it in our interest for Saudi Arabia to be protected or its kingdom to be protected? Or do you draw a distinction? Well, let me tell you what is not in our interest is this alliance that uh, has been long standing between the United States and Saudi Arabia in spite of the fact that they are directly and indirectly supporting Al Qaeda, a terrorist group that attacked us on 9 11. We just observed the 18th anniversary of that terrible attack on our country in 2001. They are continuing to spend billions of dollars every year uh, propagating this extremist. Uh, Wahhabi ideology that's fueling the growth of terrorist groups like Al Qaeda and ISIS and others around the world. Uh, they are directly supporting those who pose a threat to our country and to the United States, that threat that we need to defeat. Is that threat greater than Iran? Yes, it is. 
So currently, Saudi Iran Arabia not, is more of a problem Iran, for us than Iran Currently, Iran does not pose a direct threat to the United States. We have the opportunity to make sure that we prevent Iran from continuing to move forward towards developing a nuclear weapon. Uh, that's where we need to be focused. If I were president right now, that's exactly what I'd be doing, getting back into that nuclear deal, uh, getting rid of these crippling economic sanctions, and being able to make sure we can move forward in the interest of our national security. So a president Tulsa Gabbard would see Saudi Arabia as a bigger threat to our country than, than Iran. What I would like to see is Saudi Arabia ending their support for Al Qaeda, terrorist groups like Al Qaeda, uh, who I'm pose sorry, a threat to I the asked. American I, people. It's not what I asked. Be, I know you're, you're, now, you're turning but, my words around. No, 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 you're no, 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 my I, words I want, around. I want to just be very clear. But, but you, you have a, a higher opinion of Iran than you do Saudi Arabia. As no, things stand no, that's out. not at all what I'm saying. Then that's explain. not what I'm saying. I'm focused on how we can best keep the American people safe, on how we can make sure that we, are, uh, we have our national security intact. And the and Saudis, so are, a bigger threat, that the we Saudis take, are a bigger threat to that safety than Iran. I just want to be clear. The Saudis are directly supporting the very terrorist group that attacked us on 9-11 and that continue to pose a threat to the American people today. So if the president were to take action against Iran, with or without Saudi intelligence or help, that would be a bad move in your eyes. That would be a very bad move. It would not serve the interests of the United States. It would cost thousands more of my brothers and sisters in uniform their lives. It would cost us as taxpayers trillions of dollars more. It would make the Iraq war that I served in look like a picnic compared to the cost and the consequence and the devastation that would come about as a result of that war. What to speak of the fact that it would be unconstitutional given the president would do that without that authority coming from Congress. So that went off the rails, but it ended on a really strong note. So let's break it down. So Cavuto asked her, is it in our interest for Saudi Arabia to be protected? And I think that she handled that answer well, but if it were me, I would have just rejected the premise of that question altogether because this notion that Iran is more militaristic and aggressive than Saudi Arabia is nonsensical. I mean, when what was arguably a proxy war in Yemen ended up devolving into a genocide by Saudi Arabia, it's comical to suggest that Saudi Arabia is innocent here. And she explained why Saudi Arabia is not a good ally. And I would have added that, you know, when you are committing a genocide in Yemen and carrying out human rights abuses of your own people, when women are treated as third-class citizens, when atheists and LGBTQ people are put to death, yeah, they're not a good ally. They're not good. So if there's any relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia that goes deeper than just a sheer economic relationship, then it should be us exerting pressure on them in a positive way, using diplomacy, using soft power to get them to actually stop with the myriad human rights abuses. So um, she did a good job, but as you can see, she said something that essentially got Neil Cavuto off the rails. It made his head explode nearly and he couldn't move on after this. So she said, currently, Iran does not pose a direct threat to the United States. For her to go on Fox News and say that, their heads are exploding. Like you could hear, if you listen closely, heads exploding across the country because that is something that is unfathomable. To progressives, you know, that's just common sense. But if you are a Fox News viewer, that is something that seems counterintuitive because all these years, think about this, if you've been tuning into Fox News, all you've heard about is how bad Iran is and how they pose a direct threat to us and they want a nuclear weapon so they can use it on either us or one of our allies, Saudi Arabia, Israel. But what she just said there was a dose of cold water. And it's why Neil Cavuto, at that point, he was triggered and he couldn't get past the fact that she basically was saying that Iran isn't a threat and Saudi Arabia may possibly be a bigger threat to, you know, world peace than Iran, especially as they carry out a genocide. I mean, crazy thought, right? And even though that was pretty redundant with him just going back and forth with her, I did want you to be able to watch that play out just so you can see how ridiculous, you know, it, it really was. And she ended on an important note that I think you can't really overstate. It's important that we emphasize Donald Trump does not have the authority, constitutionally speaking, to unilaterally wage war with Iran. He doesn't get to do that. Congress makes war. Congress 
not the president. So the idea that we're even entertaining, well, will Donald Trump take us to war? Like, we need to understand the president should not be doing this because they don't have the authority to do that. And the expansion of executive power, it's been its been this ongoing phenomenon now for decades. Political scientists have been tracking it, and it's, it's absolutely time that Congress takes back their authority to declare war. So she ended strong, and, you know, that was really important. I wish that she would have pushed back you know, against Dave Rubin as much as she did against Neil Cavuto here. But this was a really strong interview. And what she's doing here is trying to shift the Overton window to the left when it comes to foreign policy issues. And that's super important, especially when we're talking to Fox News. Fox News viewers, they will accept whatever, you know, they are told. They'll accept anything. And they've been fed this line of nonsensical propaganda that Iran is at our doorstep, ready to attack us at any moment, and they're overly aggressive. And what she's saying is, actually, here's the truth. The Iran deal was good, if you care about peace, and no, Iran isn't actually a threat to us. That's not going to be something that will resonate with a lot of Fox News viewers, because again, look at the like-to-dislike ratio, but it's still something that is important in terms of just planting seeds and getting us on the right path. Maybe a couple viewers will take the liberty to Google what she said and learn a little bit. Um, maybe some of them reject it and they have that cognitive dissonance that they're not willing to fight through. But, you know, they just, they hear it from her and then they hear it again and maybe they start to have doubts. This is what political di discourse needs. We need someone to, you know, get in that bubble of Fox News, shake it up and tell them the truth. Bernard Sanders has unquestionably stepped up his game, and it seems like at least twice a week, he's releasing new policies that are more sweeping, more progressive, more robust than they were before. And this week is no different. So he just released a housing for all plan that would change so many lives that as I read through the details of this plan, it actually gave me chills. So as Tell Axelrod of The Hill reports, White House hopeful Senator Bernie Sanders on Wednesday released a $2.5 trillion plan to guarantee housing for every American. Sanders said the plan would guarantee every American, regardless of income, a fundamental right to a safe, decent, accessible, and affordable home and would be paid for by a wealth tax on the top one-tenth of one percent of income earners. There is virtually no place in America where a full-time minimum wage worker can afford a decent two-bedroom apartment at a time when half of our people are living paycheck to paycheck. This is unacceptable, he said. For too long, the federal government has ignored the extraordinary housing crisis in our country. That will end when I am president. Sanders' plan seeks to invest $1.48 trillion in over 10 years in the National Affordable Housing Trust Fund to build and maintain 7.4 million quality, affordable, and accessible housing units that he says will eliminate the gap in affordable housing for the lowest income renters. It would also invest another $400 billion to build 2 million mixed income social housing units. He also intends to use the plan to end homelessness by prioritizing 25,000 National Affordable Housing Trust Fund units to house the homeless in his first year in office and provide $500 million to state and local governments to help connect the homeless to case management and social services. The Democratic Socialist lambasted corrupt real estate developers for jacking up rent prices and President Trump for cutting federal housing programs. He says he would create an office within the Department of Housing and Urban Development to strengthen rent control and tenant protections and make data on evictions and rent increases available to the public. So just pause for a moment and try to think through the ramifications of this in the event this were codified into law. This would most definitely end housing insecurity in America once and for all. And this actually could literally end homelessness. This isn't a guarantee. We'd have to wait a couple of years to see how this plays out once it's implemented. But this actually has a shot of ending homelessness. And let me explain to you why this is so important and why this is so special. Bernie is doing this out of a place of moral courage. Because even if you claim that you are representing, you know, lower class constituents, the downtrodden, people don't talk about homelessness and homeless people because 
they're not viewed as a real political constituency. I mean, they don't have homes, so you can't send them campaign mailers. It's difficult to get in contact with them. So a lot of times, politicians just kind of give up and ignore their needs. But what Bernie Sanders is doing here is he's taking the initiative and he's saying, no, these are Americans and they deserve a home. Every American deserves a safe and accessible and affordable home, including homeless people. And that is absolutely commendable. Um, and it's really touching that Bernie cares about this. Like, you can say just in the abstract that you care about homelessness and it concerns you. But to really come up with a plan that would eliminate it, possibly, this is a next level. I mean, Bernie Sanders is changing the game. And even if this never comes to fruition and never passes, still, he's shifting the Overton window to the left and he's getting people to think about possible solutions to the homeless crisis. Now, there is that price tag that I already know Republicans will complain about, and some corporate Democrats will say that this is bad as well. But consider this for a moment. If you're concerned about the deficit and the price tag before you can control, understand that giving the homeless homes overall is actually more cost efficient than the current status quo. It will net save us money. And this was based off of research from Central Florida where a study found that it actually costs three times as much to police homeless people and, you know, get them to move certain areas than it does to just put them in a house. You know, emergency services, um, law enforcement, that all costs money currently. So we'd spend less on homelessness if we just give homeless people homes. Housing is also a really effective way to reduce alcohol abuse, drug abuse in some instances, and overall, morally speaking, this is just the right course of action because it's difficult to get clean. You know, if you are a drug user and you are an abuser of substances, how do you get clean? And in some instances, maybe drugs is your only escape, you feel, because if you're sleeping on the streets, what are you supposed to do, right? Um, so this is just all around incredible policy, and it's not just about homelessness, so I don't want to overemphasize that even though it's incredibly important but housing insecurity is such a huge issue we have landlords across the country that are overly greedy people they need to be secure they need to feel as if they don't have to worry that they will lose the roof that is over their heads i mean it's a basic necessity that nobody's talking about so there's a number of basic necessities right as human beings we should be guaranteed by right of citizenship um and just as a member of the human race clean drinking water Healthcare, you know, a roof over our head, basic civil rights and civil liberties. These are things that are non-negotiable. And the way that Bernie Sanders has brought this to the forefront of, you know, political discourse and increased the salience of these issues, it's remarkable. Bernie Sanders has done more to change and shift the Overton window in this country than any politician since Ronald Reagan. And when it comes to left-wing politicians, uh, definitely since FDR. So this is why the more that I see Bernie Sanders run this dynamic campaign where he's constantly putting out policy, I can't help but think it's like he has a plan for everything. You know, I find it funny because publicly Donald Trump has been huffing and puffing and he talks a big game about how he wants to make socialists and, you know, uh, socialism, members of the squad, uh, the Green New Deal, all the main representatives of the Democratic Party, because in 2020, it will be easier to run against socialism than it will be to run against um, capitalism. The Green New Deal, right? Green New Deal. I encourage it. I think that, uh, I think it's really something that they should promote. That's just talk. And behind closed doors, he's saying something very differently. In fact, he's telling his closest confidants that socialism might not be too easy to beat after all. So this story is fascinating. It's from The Daily Beast by Asawin Subsang and Sam Stein. And it's titled, Trump privately tells confidants that socialism won't be so easy to beat in 2020. The president is not totally sold on the attack line that he and his team have made so central to their campaign. And let me just pause before we dive into the article. Um, it's funny because you really see 
Fox News, the Republican Party, Donald Trump, all zero in on socialism. They're trying to make AOC the face of the Democratic Party and individuals like Bernie Sanders, who identify as Democratic Socialists, the faces of the Democratic Party. But you can already see that that's not working because you are building their name recognition. And even if you may not necessarily be making them more popular per se, you're still spreading their ideas. So when you go and you fish through AOC's Instagram in order to try to find something to criticize her for, you're just broadcasting her message to a bigger audience. So of course, this is going to backfire. It's not a good long-term strategy, but I'm glad it's backfiring. And I'm glad that we're learning that actually maybe they realize that socialism is a little bit more of a threat than they initially thought. So let's get to the article. As he campaigns for re-election, Donald Trump and his team have made trashing the socialists or communists in the 2020 Democratic presidential field a cornerstone of their messaging. In private, however, the president often strikes a different, more nuanced, tone, one driven by a concern that socialism, at least as defined by the Democrats, may actually sell politically. This year, Trump has repeatedly told friends and donors that running against socialism in a general election may not be so easy because of its populist draw. According to four Republicans and sources close to Trump who've heard him say this over the past several months, according to a person who was in the room, Trump told donors at a recent private event that though a lot of people think it'll be easy to beat in 2020, the truth is it might not be so easy. The president, according to the source, said that you can have someone who loves Trump, but many people love free stuff too. He added that if candidates tell Americans, especially young voters, that they're going to cancel their debt, that's a tough one to run against. I have discussed the popularity of the Democratic Socialist message, i.e. Sanders and Elizabeth Warren with President Trump, on more than one occasion, and in person, said Eric Bowling a Blaze TV host and a friend of the Trump family. Specifically, the idea of excusing debt and giving away, as Trump says, free stuff becoming more and more popular among younger voters. So I really find this fascinating because even if it's common sense to me and people who are politically savvy like you watching this, you know, anyone who's in Washington, D.C., anyone who's a strategist, they're stupid. And Donald Trump is absolutely idiotic. But it's interesting that they're realizing that going up against the populist appeal of socialism is, in fact, something that's not going to be as easy to beat. Now, look, nobody is a sure bet, but this is why I've maintained that Bernie Sanders has the strongest chance going up against Donald Trump. Because when you are a populist, when you are explicitly saying, we're going to tax the rich and invest in a social safety net that directly benefits you, that is popular. It's part of the reason why Donald Trump was incredibly popular and he was this insurgent candidate even within the Republican Party's field in 2016 because he was saying, we're going to protect Social Security, we're going to protect Medicare. Now, of course, it was a lie, but even though he may be dim-witted, even if he has a low IQ, just I think objectively speaking, he does have the political instinct to kind of see that you do have to appeal to just everyday Americans, right? You have to understand that the establishment is incredibly unpopular and the fact that he understands that, that's what I think ultimately facilitated his success in 2016. And he's smart out of his own self-interest to acknowledge that that anti-establishment appeal, that has not faded away. And, you know, the problem is that he is largely seen as the establishment's errand boy. So, you know, it would behoove him to maybe rather than trying to smear people who are socialist and Bernie and AOC, they're not actually democratic socialists. If you look up the technical definition of that term, they are social democrats who believe in a mixed economy. But if Donald Trump was smart, he would try to steal some of their platform. He just canceled the debt of disabled veterans when it comes to uh, student loans. So why not broaden that out and say, I'm going to cancel the debt of all veterans or the debt of all people making X amount of dollars or go crazy, cancel all debt. Like you can actually undercut that message if you're smart. But the thing about Donald Trump is even though he knows being anti-establishment is a winning strategy, he doesn't have that authenticity anymore because he is the president and he has done the bidding of the establishment. The first thing he did, his first major legislative accomplishment was a tax cut for himself and the elites. So, of course, even if he came with this really bold debt cancellation plan, which he knows is popular, 
Nobody would believe him because, one, he lies every two seconds, and two, Bernie Sanders is more genuine. So this is why um, Bernie has got to be the nominee. I think that it's really difficult at this time in the race to say definitively that one person is definitely going to defeat Donald Trump because things can change. 2020 is a long ways off, at least until the general. But if we're just looking at this and we have our finger on the pulse of America, we know America's anti-establishment. Americans are desperate. And we know that Bernie Sanders has that appeal. He can win back the Rust Belt. So, you know, it's interesting that Donald Trump is actually admitting, actually, it might not be so easy to defeat socialism after all, even if I've been saying the complete opposite. Very, very interesting. So, I mean, this kind of confirms the obvious. You know, I, I said this, I think, back at the beginning of when Bernie Sanders launched his campaign, that Donald Trump was lying when he said that he was the most afraid of Joe Biden. Because, obviously, Bernie Sanders is the biggest threat to Donald Trump. And now that he's admitting this publicly, or not publicly, but privately, you know, it, it's obvious, but it's interesting that he would actually admit this, especially to donors who you are supposed to, you know, imbue with confidence that you're going to win. Otherwise, why would they donate and invest in you? So, fascinating all around. Of course, Donald Trump is correct here. He absolutely should be afraid of Bernie Sanders. Because if Bernie Sanders is the Democratic Party nominee, Donald Trump's ass will most likely be kicked. And I would love to see that after watching this disaster unfold over the course of the last couple of years. We need to defeat Donald Trump. Bernie is our ticket, not just to a Democratic White House, but social democracy. Let's help him help us. Let's elect Bernie. The party that supposedly supports states' rights is showing, yet again, how selective they are in the application of that philosophy. Because when it comes to bodily autonomy and civil rights, they're very pro-states' rights because they want to make sure that red states have the authority to discriminate against their citizens as they see fit. However, when it comes to e-cigarettes and protecting the environment, they're not very states' rights. Now, of course, you know I am referring to Donald Trump's decision to revoke California's legal authority to set its own emission standards. And this is important because California's economy is absolutely massive. So even if they're just one state, if they set a particular environmental standard, then it would really behoove businesses to follow that standard nationally because it will be more cost efficient since California is such a massive part of the economy. So if you're going to have one set of standards that are different for other states than it is for California and some other blue states, then that doesn't really make sense from an economic standpoint. So if you're a business, then absolutely you want to make sure to just do what California wants so you have just one standard universally at the national level. The problem, though, is that Donald Trump Trump didn't like this because it gives a blue state a tremendous amount of power and he sees power as a zero-sum game. So if they have power, then he doesn't. And when it comes to the environment, he absolutely does not want California to have a nationwide impact on any industry. So what does he choose to do? Well, when it comes to the auto industry, at least, he just revokes their ability to set their own standards. Simple as that. So instead, he wants these auto emissions to be subject to federal standards as opposed to the standard that California sets. Mind you, with Donald Trump in charge, uh, with a right-wing EPA in control, these federal standards are more lax. They are worse for the environment. So what he's doing here, it just shows how antagonistic he is towards the environment. But I'm talking about this story even though it's late because this isn't going to be just a one and done deal. He's not just going to be able to say, you know what, California, you're no longer going to be able to set your own emission standards because guess what? California, thankfully, is pushing back. And this is most likely going to end up being a pretty huge legal battle. And as Lydia O'Connor of HuffPost writes, California officials said Wednesday that they're prepared to fight President Donald Trump over his announcement announcement that he's revoking the state's legal authority to set its own car emission standards. At a press conference, state leaders emphasized that they've long anticipated this move by the Trump administration and that they plan to take Trump to court over it as soon as possible. This is the fight of a lifetime for us. We have to win this, California Air Resources Board Chairwoman Mary Nichols said, adding that she's been paying her dues to the State Bar of California just in readiness for this moment so that she could be part of the litigation. Shortly before she spoke, Trump tweeted out confirmation that he was revoking a waiver that's long allowed the state to establish its own tailpipe emissions policy, upending decades of bipartisan support for
for that exception. The president argued that revoking the waiver would make cars cheaper and safer while making little difference in emissions and creating more jobs. This is simply inaccurate, Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom retorted on Twitter, saying the looser standards Trump wants would cost consumers $400 billion and result in $320 billion more gallons of oil burned and spewed into our air. And in this instance, Governor Newsom is 100% correct. And I don't even know how Donald Trump would reach that type of conclusion. And you can only logically assume that he's following some type of libertarian philosophy where he thinks that if you just, you know, you deregulate, you allow the market to self-regulate, then that will be the best thing for consumers. Um, except we're not talking about a particular company making cookies and, you know, maybe they go out of business because it makes people feel sick. There is a real information imbalance here that people aren't considering. Who is going to purchase a car and then think about all of these really specific things with regard to, you know, emissions and whatnot? This is why the state should be handling something like that. But, you know, this is par for the course for Donald Trump, who it seems like he doesn't just not care about the environment, which would be one thing. I mean, if he just was ambivalent. That'd still be awful, but he is actively trying to ruin the planet faster. And it's one thing that is puzzling. It's what him and his Brazilian counterpart, Jair Bolsonaro, is doing. And it just, I mean, on one hand, you can say, well, look, they're old, so they don't have to see the consequences, you know, and they don't care about destruction on a mass scale. They don't care about the habitability of our planet because they're older. But I mean, if you have a kid, don't you have any concern whatsoever? I mean, there's no way that he actually is a climate change denier because if you look at the stories regarding his golf courses, he absolutely is concerned with the effects of climate change. So, I mean, to just be overly antagonistic, what's the reason? to own the libs like I, I just I don't get it I think there's multiple things that come into play I think part of it is power he's power hungry he doesn't want California to kind of reduce from his power uh, because they don't want California to uh, you know take away from what the federal government can do and since he's in control of the federal government maybe that has something to do with it I don't know but all I know is that this is psychopathic at this point and Donald Trump absolutely must be defeated if we want a fighting chance just as a species like we're not just talking about the Supreme Court we're not just talking about public policy we're talking about our survivability the habitability of our planet if we don't defeat him that's four more years that we lose that we just don't have so um I'm watching all of this in terror and I I just it makes no sense to me how Republicans don't care. Like, if you are a young Republican, I'll reason with you. Let's say, hypothetically speaking, you don't believe in climate change. Do you still not worry about the consequences of our actions, having breathable air that's not polluted, that is healthy, you know? I mean, if you want to be healthy and breathe clean air, don't you have an interest in that just from the standpoint of you being a self-interested, rational actor? I just, I don't get it. I don't understand conservatism and this Republican philosophy. Everything they do seems to be motivated by, you know, some way to trigger the libs or fuck up the planet. And it's just, it's psychopathic. It's psychopathic. And it's time that we call it like we see it. This is absolutely insanity. And Donald Trump, this is probably just about power. But either way, we, you know, I hope that California wins this fight because, um, you know, it's just one more nail in the planet's coffin. And we don't need that now. One thing that I have found really fascinating about this election cycle is the stark difference between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren's bases of support. You would think that there's going to be a lot of overlap there, but there's not much in actuality, which is a little bit strange. So Bernie Sanders has, you know, a more racially diverse, lower socioeconomic base of support, and Elizabeth Warren has more wealthy, college-educated whites who support her. And that's not the one thing that has surprised me, you know, about this election cycle. The fact that numerous polls indicate that Bernie Sanders is the second choice of Biden supporters is also perplexing. So people, you know, sometimes you can rationalize the way that they come to conclusions. Other times I'm left speechless. So it's why I really enjoy segments where we just 
see people interview voters. I think that's important. Yes, these are anecdotes, but whenever I see Allison Camerata talk to a panel of voters in Iowa and CNN, whenever I see Emma Viglin of Rebel HQ go out and talk to Trump supporters or, you know, Amy Klobuchar supporters, I always find these incredibly fascinating because if you don't talk to people, then you're not really going to understand the way that they're thinking, and that's going to make it more difficult to sell Bernie Sanders to them. So I think that we need to be engaging with people who we wouldn't normally engage with because we need to talk to them to find common ground, to figure out ways to sell the policies of Bernie Sanders to them so we can win. Now, one thing that Emma did recently on uh, Rebel HQ, she talked to Warren supporters about why they're choosing Warren over Bernie Sanders, something that I absolutely am curious about. And I'm here to kind of give you uh, my reaction here because I think that this is interesting. I don't know fully what to expect when you compare Warren supporters with other candidates. If you talk to Joe Biden supporters, I mean, I wouldn't expect much policy substance. If you talk to Donald Trump supporters, I would expect sheer lunacy. But if you talk to Elizabeth Warren supporters, I would guess it's a mixed bag. So Emma is going to talk to them and we will uh, watch. Senator Elizabeth Warren has filled out this Washington Square Park rally here in New York City. There's so many people here. Her popularity just keeps growing and growing. So I wanted to ask her supporters why her, why not? Let me just pause it real quick because that note about her popularity, it scares me. Um, Elizabeth Warren has a lot of momentum now. And when you look at aggregate polling data, real clear politics averages, her and Bernie are in a statistical tie. She just is starting to pass him. Um... So Bernie, I feel like he's doing pretty much everything right. I think he should be harsher when he attacks Biden, but he keeps releasing these policies and Elizabeth Warren still is gaining momentum. Part of that may have to do with the fact that the mainstream media loves her. But either way, this is something that we need to acknowledge and be cognizant of. I, like, I don't think people should bury their heads in the sand and think, well, you know what, this is just one point in time, that'll change. We need to take this seriously because this is a fight for our lives. And if you're watching this show, you're politically savvy enough to know that there are stark, strong, significant differences between Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. So just keep that in mind. But I digress. Sanders, if it's really just on policy, those two are closest. So why support her over the further left, more democratic socialist version in Bernie. I think Bernie's message kind of resonated with everyone at first and she can kind of carry the torch farther than he can with others, different uh, demographics and supporters and things like that. So I think she has a more of electability factor than Bernie does this time. So that doesn't make sense to me um, because Elizabeth Warren's base is more white. Bernie's is more multiracial. Now, back in 2016, when Bernie Sanders didn't have a lot of name recognition, there were political analysts that said this was a problem for Bernie. Now, this guy is just a normal person, so I don't want to harp on him too much. But to see her as more electable is interesting because I do not view Elizabeth Warren as more electable uh, than Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders, I believe, is the most electable candidate against Donald Trump. Um, and I say this because of that anti-establishment appeal. I think he would do really well in the Rust Belt. When you look at head-to-head -head matchups between Bernie and Trump in the Rust Belt, it looks good. So I'm not going to say that it's a sure bet, but he's our best bet. And when it comes to Elizabeth Warren, if you pit her against Donald Trump, I think she can beat him. But my confidence goes down substantially. I think it's more of a toss-up. I think that maybe she'd be the favorite, but it's not it's not going to be an easy race. Um, I think Biden would basically be a sure bet that we lose to Donald Trump. Warren, I think it's more 50-50. Bernie, I think he's our best shot, but we'll continue. I got into Elizabeth Warren a long time ago. If you remember in 08, the housing crisis in California, we lost our home, including everybody on my row in Sacramento, California, along with rows and rows of homes. And I couldn't understand it. I was still in high school, so I didn't understand why we lost our home, but they just said, you know, the recession, right? So as I got older, I got some researching, and I saw her and how she's been fighting and screaming at the top of her lungs about why we're going to recession, how this can bankrupt American families, and at the end of the day, what we can do about it. So then she ran for Senate, and then she's been out there being the voice of what I really have been going through. So I believe in her in my heart and soul. I understand the Bernie supporters. I get them. 
but Elizabeth is my heart and soul because I feel like she's really speaking to what I've been through. And I'm still a capitalist. I still believe in markets, but I believe in rules and regulations. Like everything she believes in, I really do believe in. I like Senator Warren. Okay, so that person right there is kind of who I would envision as someone, you know, as for the reasons why they'd support Warren over Bernie. Um, and I don't think that you can persuasively argue that Bernie is better for that individual. He personally likes Elizabeth Warren. And like, I think that the instinct, if you're a Bernie supporter um, and you're probably to the left of him, would think, well, I have to convince him on policies X, Y, and Z, why Bernie is stronger here. I think that's a waste of energy. I think that what we need to do is go after people who are not as certain, who don't necessarily know about the differences between Bernie Sanders. And if somebody knows that Elizabeth Warren is a capitalist to her core and maybe she doesn't want to blow up the game but just change the rules a little bit, that's going to be difficult to argue against. So I wouldn't dedicate my time just if I had a family member like this. You know, well, I mean, I would if I had a family member because I argue with anyone in my family. But I mean, like, if you know a friend like this, I think your time is better spent going after people who aren't already committed because it's going to be very difficult to get someone like that to budge. I mean, you can make the case, yeah, capitalism sucks, democratic socialism or social democracy, that's the way to go. But you're not going to convince them, you know, in, in that short amount of time. We have a finite, finite amount of time. Why is that so hard to say? Um, so I think that it's really important for us to focus on the gettable people. And I just feel like that person is not gettable. He has his reasons. And I think at that point, we just have to respect him and move on to the next person and, um, try to woo them. Because she has, well, like her slogan is, I have a plan for everything, but also she talks about getting rid of the filibuster, which I think is very important because nothing will be passed if you don't get rid of the filibuster because one. We'll okay. I got to stop it because again, this is hard to argue against if you're a Bernie Sanders supporter. Like, he... I disagree with him on the filibuster. Um, and I also disagree with him when it comes to court packing. So those are, like, the only two areas where you can say, uh, realistically, that Elizabeth Warren outflanks him to the left. So I don't know how to argue against that because I technically agree more with Warren here, although Bernie Sanders did kind of give me a little bit more confidence when he said that he would use budget reconciliation to get just like a 50 plus one vote to pass policies like Medicare for all. But ideally, I think that, you know, look, if we get rid of the filibuster, is that a risk? Yes, but it's a risk that I think we need to take, right? Because Republicans will do it. So there's no reason why we should continue to impose this hurdle on ourselves when we need to pass these policies. So that is a good reason to cite there um, when it comes to why she supports Warren over uh, Bernie. I would argue that policy is more important, but it's hard to argue against there. So I like this is why I wanted to talk about this, because I think that this is interesting. Like we need to be constructing ways to respond because this isn't like, you know, we're arguing with Hillary Clinton supporters where they just they love her hair, you know, or they love that she's a woman. Um, we're, we're talking with people who I think are more politically astute, generally speaking. You know, it's it's difficult to generalize a whole block of voters, but um, these people seem to know more what they're talking about. So um, we need to arm ourselves with a little bit of knowledge about where they're coming from because I want to convince them um, and we're not going to be able to convince all of them. It's just a matter of who, who can we convince or have enough votes in the Senate to get anything passed. And I just think she's so smart and she's awesome. I just love her. I, I like Bernie too. Bernie's awesome too, so. I think a great ticket would be her and Bernie, but that's too much to ask. Bernie, why are you here at this Elizabeth Warren rally? <laughs> that is legitimately creepy. You know, it makes me feel uneasy. <laughs> All right, should be campaigning. That get is back creepy. To it. She's not my candidate yet, 100%. I like Pete Buttigieg, but I like her, I like, I like that she has a plan. Um, a plan? I like Pete Buttigieg. Okay, now we're getting into some shaky territory here. All right. So it's between her and Pete Buttigieg. Oh, yeah, but also maybe even Amy Klobuchar and Cory Booker. I'm not, I'm not even close to picking one person yet. But if Okay, I have to stop it. Oh, my God. How? How are you not close? There's... And look, I get it. These people are not glued to politics like me. So I'm trying to sympathize with them from that perspective. But at the same time, I mean, 
Amy Klobuchar and Elizabeth Warren are so different to kind of waver on who you want. It's like you don't have a concrete political ideology picked out for you. Um, I don't know. I don't know what factors she's considering, but I kind of, um, I kind of uh, shot myself in the foot by preempt preemptively saying that these are more educated people because she doesn't seem as educated or politically astute. Um, so I'm eating my own words now, but let's uh, let her continue here. I'm going to go for somebody like on the left side of the spectrum. It's going to be Elizabeth Warren as opposed to any of the others like Bernie or anybody like that. So, so why not Bernie? Um, it's time for a woman is all. I mean, Bernie's over and done. Didn't do it the last time. I've, Elizabeth has more energy. I think she's got more intelligence. So I think more. Okay, when you start resorting to someone's energy and intelligence, then you're just grasping. And it seems like she's more like moderate with the way that she said, um, you know, if I'm going to go for anyone left, it's going to be Elizabeth Warren. So it seems like maybe the fact that Elizabeth Warren is further to the right than Bernie, um, even if it's marginally, maybe that's something that appeals to her. This is tricky, guys. People can relate to her, and I like that she's a woman. Bernie shirt right there. And um, and she's very smart. She's very sharp. I mean, I so is Bernie. I'm not sure any of them are as quite as smart as she is. Bernie's a great guy. He's fought really hard. But I just don't think that people are going to elect someone that of that age, unfortunately. Um, and it would be great to see a woman president. I think that this country, this country elected Barack Obama, the first Ameri African-American president, we can't elect the first woman. I think that's where this country needs to go. Okay. So that was depressing and soul-crushing because it's like... <laughs> And I mean, th these are people at a war and rally, so they're the most energetic about the candidate that they support. But, you know, I just feel like we have this one unique opportunity. There's only one Bernie Sanders. There's only one person who's saying, I'm not just going to tweak the rules. We're blowing up the game. And it just feels like, you know, people don't grasp that. Maybe they're not looking at this holistically. I don't know what it is, but, um, you know, this is definitely... We're playing on expert level difficulty here. Back in 2016, you know, we can go toe to toe with Hillary supporters and nine times out of 10, they really didn't have a legitimate reason to support Hillary Clinton, even, you know, from their own perspectives. Like Hillary was just bad on a lot of policies. Elizabeth Warren is no Hillary Clinton. She's no Bernie, but she's no Hillary. So it's more difficult to kind of like argue against Elizabeth Warren here from the perspective of, you know, being a Bernie Sanders supporter. And I want people to understand that, to those of us who are engaged in politics, who follow this religiously, if you're watching this video, you follow politics in the 2020 election religiously. Like, when we talk about the differences between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, it's obvious. But to normal people, just average political consumers, it feels like we're splitting hairs. Um, and this is kind of the experience that I've had in talking with Warren supporters who I know personally. They just, they can't understand, Mike, why would you support, you know, Bernie over Warren when they're the same and you can also, you know, get a woman president? Now, of course, I run through my entire list. You already know the same shit that I say. It's the same shit that I say on the podcast. Um, it's just a matter of how we pitch it. And it's tough. When you see Bernie and Warren head to head, um, you do have to draw these distinctions, but I've made this point before, and I think it's important for us to kind of go after uh, Warren now when Biden is still in the race. Like, if Biden wins, who's still the biggest threat, we're all fucked, Bernie and Warren supporters. And I don't think that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren should aim at each other, because if they start driving down each other's support, then Biden could potentially get a boost, or some other corporatist like Kamala could rise again, or Pete Buttigieg. So we're kind of in this weird situation at this point in time. Maybe this will change. I mean, these, these poll results, they're a good indicator of where people are at. But, you know, this can change, right? Um, so I don't know, but I, I think that this was interesting. And I hope that people will listen to voters and try to figure out ways to, um, to just argue for their candidate. Now, there's one other video that I want to play from Emma Viglin where she asks, Do Warren supporters like Bernie? 
Part one is attack the corruption head on. Part two is now this is from June, by the way. Structural changes, but um, nonetheless, economy. same theme. And part three, let's protect our democracy. Let's not do big fundraisers in the general then, maybe? I'm rally in Miami the day before she's set to take the stage in the first Democratic debate. What's interesting to me is that Elizabeth Warren seems to have the support of many establishment-minded voters. Yeah. Third Way said they'd be okay with her, uh, although I think that's the minority, and also progressive-minded voters. So she's bringing these two groups together. Why is that? And uh, if Elizabeth Warren isn't the nominee, who would these Warren supporters back instead? And this is, is a Elizabeth good question. Warren your number one candidate? would you say I would say she's in my top two who's the other one can I guess is it Bernie Sanders no not Bernie uh, Kamala Harris is oh my two. god is it between her and Elizabeth You're fucking Warren. killing me probably Kamala Harris what I kind of want to learn more about the other candidates she's and this was second, from June mind you but I want to learn more about Yang so by my this is before Elizabeth Tulsi Warren crushed the Kamala aggressive candidate in the race after Bernie Sanders so I was curious to find that a lot of the supporters here aren't considering Bernie Sanders as their second or third choice candidate, and in fact, don't like him at all in some instances. The 2016 what? election was so divisive um, and tore apart the Republican Party, and I mean, the Democratic Party, and, and that is part of the reason that we have Trump in the White House, and I just think that it's really, I mean, it's, it's just not the right time. We've got to get rid of Trump in power, and I don't believe that having Bernie in the mix is um, a good thing for the party. I'm a supporter of Elizabeth Warren. Um, I'm actively donating to her and to Bernie Sanders. I think those are the only two candidates right now that are representing uh, quality values in Americans, the young people um, against corruption, standing up against corruption, the big corporations that are uh, polluting the environment and just run, running over all our industries, exporting our workers overseas and um, just keeping all the profits for themselves. I don't understand where the discrepancy comes in. I mean, it could be that Warren is a registered Democrat or Warren is a woman. I don't know. I don't think people, when they say that they don't like Bernie Sanders but they like Elizabeth Warren, I don't think there's a lot of substance to that. I, I think maybe they are unaware of how close on the issues they actually are. A lot of people would say that Bernie yeah. Sanders is closest to Elizabeth Warren on policy. He's not in your top three considerations. Um, just Why? Um, what happened in like the previous, um, you know, presidential run? I, I was for him for a while, but I feel that his values are a little too extreme for me. If Bernie's looking like he's gonna lose uh, to Biden, then I'll definitely have to switch support to to uh, to Bernie. Can you explain why it's between Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren? Yeah, so uh, I think it comes back to the kind of the similar reasons why I was a big Hillary supporter. Um, I was raised uh. by my mom, and I guess through the eyes of my mom, I kind of understood the the unfair struggles that you know women have to go through, especially in in a world dominated by men. It's about opportunity. So you opt for Hillary Clinton, who likes to bomb well, uh, women in the Middle East and North Africa. Cool. Okay, I'm being a dick. <laughs> um, it, a lot of Elizabeth Warren's base. It seems like there's a lot of overlap with Hillary Clinton's base, and um, you know, it's really difficult to break down, you know, human psychology here and why you, why you know policy isn't the utmost concern for you in this primary, especially if you're a Democratic Party voter. Um, they're thinking about electability. They're thinking about 2016. You know, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in if you are a Bernie Sanders supporter. But look, we've got a we've got a long way to go. Um, so I don't want you to feel depressed. I don't want you to feel demoralized. Anything could happen in this race. Things change constantly and they'll probably change 10 times until we actually see the results in Iowa, uh, which I believe is February 3rd. Um, so Kudos to Emma Viglin for doing these. I always found, find these incredibly fascinating. Um, it's nice to pick the brains of voters. It's important. Again, these are anecdotes. Um, 
but it's, it's nice to kind of step away from like the numbers. You can look at aggregate polling data and that gives you a lot of really important information, but it really, it really is important, I think, to kind of dive a little bit deeper and talk to people and ask them, you know, if they're outside of our bubble, why do you not support Bernie Sanders? If you are a Democratic Party voter, you're presumably a left winger. Why opt for someone who is essentially a centrist and, you know, Kamala Harris? So it's all incredibly important. I just wanted to share my reaction. Um, we've got our work cut out for us, but it's not over yet, folks. So don't get too discouraged. Growing up, we didn't have much, but I had dedicated parents that taught me and my sisters the importance of giving back and taking care of one another. I was sick as a kid. I had severe asthma that forced me to miss a lot of school. My mom, being the compassionate person that she is, was in and out of work because of the care that I required. My dad faced racism and inequities that prevented him from obtaining upward mobility in a sustainable way. My story has become far too common in the first district of Illinois. Many of us live in poverty. Our babies are more likely to get asthma. We're more likely to have lead in our water and more likely to be shot. We know what causes gun violence in our district. It's not a lack of morals, bad parenting, or video games. It's systemic poverty. It's educational inequity. It's the lack of universal health care. It's environmental injustice. It is a system that isn't broken because it works for those that it was designed to serve. My name is Robert Image Jr. and I'm a gun violence prevention advocate, social innovator, and nonprofit leader. I was raised in a small town named Mays Landing, New Jersey and I grew up in Auburn Gresham on the south side of Chicago. I'm running for Congress to get the federal government to understand that these are common sense gun violence prevention laws that will lead to prosperity. The solutions are simple, and that's what makes them innovative. A living wage, universal pre-K, and access to higher education for all of those who want it. Expansion of transportation accessibility, Medicare for all, and a Green New Deal. These policies and cultural shifts will allow those in our community to live with dignity. For generations, folks have been saying, this is why we can't wait by any means necessary. And enough is enough. In this moment, we cannot afford to wait our turn. Generations to come are depending on the actions we make today. In our community, we march for our lives every single day, but we ought to live in a world that we don't have to. Join our pursuit of peace and be a part of this movement. We are the solution, together. Hello everyone, I am here with Robert Emmons Jr. He is a 2020 congressional candidate running in the first congressional district of Illinois, and he is here to talk about his campaign. Robert, thank you so much for coming on the program. Of course, thank you so much for having me, Mike. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you coming on. Um, it, it's always exciting to talk to candidates from around the country. And you are from this new wave of progressives, of Democrats, who you are outspokenly progressive and you're running for Congress. And tell me why you decided to run, because if I decided to run for Congress, I wouldn't know where to even begin. So what made you want to, one, put yourself through all of this and two, be a fighter at the national level? Yeah, yeah. Um... That's a really good question that we get at every single town hall. Um, and I answer it differently sometimes, depending on what's going on in, in my life. Uh, Cause there were so many different things that happened uh, back in 2018 when I first made the decision uh, to run for office. Um, but to not, today I'll talk about uh, just how I grew up um, and once I moved to Chicago. Uh, so I moved to Chicago uh, when I was 13, turning 14 years old. Um, and I distinctly remember uh, in my high school on the south side of Chicago, every now and then having an assembly um, with the teachers would bring us all together, uh, and they would inform us that we had just lost a classmate, um, a friend, a family member, the, the uh, uh, former classmate, um, it's a gun violence that, that weekend. Um, and I remember in those moments thinking about how critical it is for us to, to act um, and to not just allow that to become normal um, because we are losing so many futures uh, to senseless gun violence. Uh, so when, when I was thinking about what I wanted to do when I finished up high school, um, I knew I wanted to get more involved in advocacy. So I applied and got admitted to the University of uh, Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with my two friends uh, in which we roomed together our freshman year. 
Um, and that's when I began to really get involved in advocacy, um, criminal justice reform, gun violence prevention, um, you name it, I really wanted to get involved in it. Uh, and during that first year of college, uh, I, re- I remember uh, talking to my friend, uh, one of my roommates, uh, about his grades um, and how they began to slip. Um, and then he received a letter from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign um, telling him that if he didn't get his act together, he'd be kicked out. Uh, and despite his best effort to, uh, to bring his grades up, uh, he was unsuccessful and ultimately kicked out. Um, with that, he, he tried to, to remain successful and, um, and, and try to be resilient like he's always been, uh, but he um, unsuccessful in that as well. Uh, and he needed to move back to Chicago. Um, and when he moved back to Chicago, he fell deeper into poverty, um, and he ended up getting into some, getting into some bad, uh, bad things here in Chicago. And in 2015, uh, he was shot and killed. Um, as you can imagine, that, that devastated me and every single uh, person that was in his orbit. And the thing that kept that resonated with me is that, statistically speaking, uh, unfortunately, his death was predictable. It was predictable because he was living in a system, in a society that failed him at every turn. Our economic system that allowed him to fall back into poverty when he moved out to Chicago, it, it failed him. Our education system that didn't give him the adequate amount of support in order to be successful. Um, It failed him. Um, And even our racist criminal justice system, um, it failed him. Uh, Instead of rehabilitating our young people, it's more focused on punitive measures, similar to the academic probation uh, that he encountered at at the University of uh, Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And I think what drove me to to run for office was, um, even though his death was, statistically speaking, uh, predictable because of what's going on in our, in our current society. It, it was also 100% preventable. Uh, it's preventable with a living wage. It's preventable with access to higher education for all of those who want it. It's preventable with Medicare for all, with the expansion of access to mental health care um, and criminal justice reform and a Green New Deal. Um, so I'm running for U.S. Congress to make this the very last generation to be faced with everyday gun violence. Um, and to do so, we need to address it uh, at its root causes. Um, and that's what we've been missing um, in our country. Uh, and the national media uh, seem to not care as much uh, about what goes on in communities like mine um, as it pertains to gun violence. Uh, so we're going to make sure that we are setting a vision uh, for the country uh, so that people in my community can live with dignity and live in safety um, and prosperity and peace. Uh, that's why we're running for, for U.S. Congress is uh, to, to fight for these progressive, uh, progressive issues, um, to, to make our, our lives and lives of generations to come um, brighter uh, than what the trajectory would suggest today. And I'm so glad that you shared that story. And the reason why I like to ask people why they're running for Congress, even if like generally speaking, like nine times out of 10, when you ask a candidate why they're running for Congress, they talk about their qualifications. They talk about, well, you know, I was a mayor and I have X, Y, and Z qualifications. But when I talk to grassroots candidates like yourself, you always really, you have this personal story, this personal thing that happened that impacted them. And the reason why I like to ask this question is because running for Congress is, it's just a huge personal sacrifice like it takes so much effort like you're probably not getting any sleep so i like to ask and there's always a reason behind that and for you that personal yeah. story absolutely um that resonates with people and i'm so glad that you you decided to step yeah. up now you talk about root causes i want to read a quote from you this is in your ad um this is probably my favorite quote of this entire um race so far so this is what you say quote it is a system that isn't broken because it works for those it was designed to serve i know what you meant by that but i want you to elaborate because that is such an amazing way to frame it and it makes so much sense so what policy prescriptions do you have to fix it yeah yeah that's i'm glad you pointed that out um it was a derivative of just what i've i've seen other activists around the country um saying so a lot of times, you, especially in rallies, we, we talk a lot about the system being broken and dismantling the system. Uh, but it occurred to me in this campaign, actually, that the system isn't necessarily um, broken. Um, it's, unfortunately, um, it's, it's corrupted and it's greedy uh, and it feeds off of the vulnerable in our communities, um, like our criminal justice system uh, and how it's fueled. 
uh, by the um, amount of folks who are incarcerated and how we've privatized our prisons uh, since 1984 um, and perpetuated policies like the 1994 crime bill uh, with exasperated vicious cycles of poverty uh, and, and, and in that case, violence in our communities. Um, and it's working pretty well. Um, the, the prison industrial complex is, is a billion dollar industry uh, for, for private institutions. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's working pretty well, um, but we do need to dismantle it because it's not working uh, well for those that was designed to hurt um, intentionally. Uh, so that's just one example of uh, what we're fighting, what we're, what we're talking about when we're talking about broken systems. So one thing we can do um, with using the criminal justice system um, as an example um, is to ban private prisons. Um, no one should profit off of, of folks being incarcerated. Um, it, it, again, it adds uh, to this, this ugliness um, that has existed in America um, for a few decades. Um, in which case, I, I know you've seen the stats, the United States has 5% uh, of the world's population and 25% of the world's prison population. Um, and one out of, that means that one out of um, um, every 110 citizens have been incarcerated um, within, within their lifetime. Um, and that's an ex ex extremely vicious, um, capitalistic way of, of repairing our society when someone um, does misbehave in, in some way. So we need to ban private prisons all, all together um, and, and invest in making sure that our system, our criminal justice system is uh, curated around repair and restoration and rehabilitation um, and not just punitive measures um, that just don't work. Um, and that's why our recidivism rate here in this country is, is so high. Uh, and, and that's what we mean when we say that the, the system is, is, is working pretty well um, because we, the folks who profit off of that are benefiting from recidivism uh, and, and keeping those keeping those jails as full, uh, as prisons as full as possible. Yeah, and that's so important. It's it's a really good way, I think, to differentiate yourself from other candidates because people will just look at this mass incarceration crisis in our country and think, wow, this must be a flaw of our system. How can this happen? But if you think about it and you know about capitalism, it's functioning exactly as you would expect because the goal of capitalism is to take every single component of our society and commodify it, turn it into some type of money-making venture. And so when you start turning prisons into this money-making venture and healthcare into a money-making venture, I mean, we really can't be surprised because this is exactly the way the system is designed. So it, 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 it takes people like you to come out and say, the system isn't broken. We just have a system that doesn't work for normal people. And I think that's so important. And for people now to come out and, you know, criticize capitalism, I do really see the Overton window starting to kind of nudge to the left. And it's all because of grassroots activists such as yourself, people who are really saying maybe it's okay to criticize capitalism. You can consider yourself a capitalist, but if you are going to allow things, these things to happen, then maybe, you know, Maybe capitalism isn't what you thought it was. You know, we think about the glorious things about capitalism. Yeah. I love my, you know, my PlayStation 4. You know, I, we love the clothes and whatnot. But we don't think about the way that this affects people at, you know, a very, very concrete level in terms of us getting our basic necessities. So it's, it's incredibly important. And that's why I wanted to bring up that quote, because it really stuck out to me. And I absolutely love it. But let me ask you this. So... Hypothetically speaking, you're elected to Congress. Um, there's a lot of things that we have to do to change the system, but there's only so much time. So let's just say we get the best case scenario. We get, you know, a Bernie Sanders president and a Democratic House and Congress <laughs> or and, and Senate. Yeah. Um, so in that first year, what do you think realistically you'd be able to accomplish if you get elected? Because this is something that for me, there's so many different policies that I want to pass. I don't think I would be able to figure out like where to begin. I would, my head would be spinning. So what would you do in the first year that you think would be feasible? In a, in a ideal world, um, in which you just painted out the scenario, um, the, the, I, I believe that the best thing that I can do for the people of the Illinois first congressional district is push uh, as hard as I can and advocate uh, with members of the house and the Senate um, to reverse the Dickey amendment 
so that the CDC can study gun violence um, as a public health epidemic. Um, gun violence is a disease and it is contagious. Uh, it is killing thousands, hundreds, dozens of thousands of Americans every, every year. Um, and until we can begin to truly study it uh, and, and get down to the root causes of, of everyday gun violence, we're not going to be able to, to address it the way we're supposed to. I am a social innovator um, by profession. Um, I go around the world uh, with an innovation lab known as Unleash, bringing together a thousand young people from around the world to solve some of our most pressing issues uh, focused on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and one of the things we, we start off with um, is the, the research um, and allowing that to, uh, to, to influence how we design programming and how we make decisions um, because we, we got it to end the epidemic of, of everyday gun violence um, now, not later. 100,000 Americans are either wounded or killed uh, by a person with a gun uh, whether that be themselves or, or someone um, in their communities um, every year. At that rate, there are going to be a million Americans that will have been directly impacted by gun violence within 10 years. Um, that is a crisis um, that isn't talked about enough um, and is only talked about uh, when there is a, a, na a national mass shooting, with, uh, which the media uh, centers in on, uh, but this is going on in our communities every single day, um, and, and we have to solve it, um, and we have to solve it once and for all, but to start, like I said, reversing uh, the, the, the Dickey Amendment uh, so we can actually study gun violence and allow that research to influence our decision um, and, and how we we advocate and continue to fight for a peaceful, peaceful world in, in all of our communities. That's awesome. Uh, what else would would you think would be feasible? Because that actually is something that I think there would actually be a large enough consensus to where that would get done. Because like it really is, it's absurd that the CDC can't study gun violence. That doesn't even make any sense. And of course, you know that is written exclusively just for the gun lobby. It's it's embarrassing that that yeah. is even a thing. Um, and I actually do think that the, even the Democratic Party would be on board with that. That's kind of a basic step. Um, what else do you think could be accomplished in that first year? Because you're going to have a lot of people. Like, what I noticed is that each um, candidate running for Congress, they all kind of have, have their own bread and butter. Like, some are focused on health care. Some are focused on housing rights. And you're coming to Congress with, you know, a, a gun reform agenda. So what else do you think could be accomplished in that first year? Because I feel like if we truly do get... Um, all three branches, well, maybe not Supreme Court, of course, that's not something, but I mean, electorally speaking, if we can elect, you know, a Democratic House, Senate, and White House, then that first year, I think we can accomplish a lot. So what else do you think could be done, realistically speaking? Absolutely. I think we can the Green New Deal, um, which is also gun violence prevention, um, and that's what we've been saying in, in, uh, around our district and around the country. The Green New Deal um, has the federal jobs guarantee portion of it. Um, and it also would help reverse the impacts of environmental racism that our communities are, are facing in dis disinvested communities around the country. We can pass Medicare for all. Um, again, gun violence prevention, uh, gun violence prevention policies uh, with the expansion of mental health care uh, for members of my community that are suffering immense amounts of trauma uh, that perpetuate cycles of, of violence. Um, I think we can pass education reform. The, the, the way we fund Schools in, 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 uh, in Illinois is, is, are heavily based off of housing taxes, uh, which means if you live uh, in a poor community, your school is likely to be under-resourced, uh, which, uh, which is an injustice in and of itself, and again, set up intentionally like that. Um, so we can, we can pass all these progressive issues. Um, and the reason why I feel prepared uh, to champion a lot of, a lot of the policies I just um, I just. Uh, I just uh, explained and, and, and listed out is when you think about a lot of these progressive issues that we fight for, um, the issues themselves that disproportionately impact uh, black men um, under the age of 35, um, like our criminal justice system, like education, like gun violence. Uh, yet we don't have a single member of Congress that fits this demographic either in the House or the Senate. Uh, so that means we're missing a key voice in Congress right now 
uh, one that understands the interconnectivity um, of these issues, um, having gone through it, having been from a community um, that is facing it, uh, and having friends and family um, that face these obstacles, and fortunately for a good amount of us, overcome them through resilience. Um, but we're missing that voice right now. Uh, and I believe I can bring in the stories of, uh, of my district and, and bring in the stories of, of people around the country um, to begin building more bridges um, in Congress so that way my kids, your kids, our grandkids aren't, aren't fighting for the same things that we have to fight for uh, right now. Uh, that's the mark of a sustainable society is generation after generation uh, progressing. Uh, and that's the way I look at progressivism. Uh, and that's why I happily call myself a progressive. Um, and given that scenario that you illustrated, um, an ideal world, uh, as long as we're, we're civically engaged right now, uh, we can realize that. Uh, I, I believe that the, the, the sky isn't even the limit for what we accomplish. Um, and then lastly, here's the big kicker, Mike. Uh, we we got we to gotta figure out a way to get money out of politics. Yeah. Um, because... That is that is what uh, what is uh, hurting and stunting our growth as a country. Um, even though you have ninety plus percent of the country um, as, uh, believing that we need comprehensive background checks, we still have a Congress um, that that isn't moving the way it's supposed to. We got we got Mitch McConnell uh, holding HR eight and HR one 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 two on on his desk uh, because of influences like. Uh, like the NRA um, and other dirty special interests that prevent them from actually moving. Um, but we need to get money out of politics. And I believe we can do that with a progressive uh, uh, executive and legislative branch. And then uh, we got some work to do on the Supreme Court. In which yeah, case, we, uh, we can talk about it. And then <laughs> we, got some work, we got some work to do. Yeah, uh, that's a whole different yeah, conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I just got off the phone with my communications director. We're writing a blog on on it, so uh, so it's fresh on my mind. We're, we yep. gotta get that, uh, get that out of it. Absolutely. Don't have to talk about that now. Oh, I, for sure, for sure. There, there's so, we could we could literally talk for 24 hours straight about everything. No, so basically, what you all talked about is it's phenomenal. You laid out like your agenda. You cited the lowest common denominator. But let me ask you this though. So you're running against Bobby Rush. Um, he's been in there since I believe the uh the 90s i want to say i don't know the exact year um so you're running against someone who doesn't have as high of a profile as other democrats so my question is oh hang on a second i just activated siri okay <laughs> sorry so my question is um what is it about bobby rush that makes you feel as if you would be a better voice for individuals in that first district of illinois because for like if for example we have shahid butar running against nancy pelosi michaela wilkes running against denny hoyer so to people who aren't in that district it's obvious but for your district you would kind of have to lay it out a little bit more for people who aren't there and don't have the context so why do you feel as if you are better suited to represent that district than bobby rush yeah that's a, a great question um, and one that's critical um, in terms of developing contrast between me and, and the, the current incumbent in which I respect. Um, and I, I, I honor his years of activism in the 60s and the 70s. Um, but since he's been a congressman, um, he was elected the same year in which I was born. Uh, I'm 26 years old. Um, he's been in Congress for 26 years. My birthday is in uh, for I guess about uh, three weeks. Uh, Happy birthday! So I only won't be able to use that. Thank you. I won't be able to use that talking point for about a month since he was elected <laughs> in the general election in November 1990. So we'll, we'll we'll stop using that for a month. It's a good um, one. But, but until then, uh, at 26 and 26 and 26, um, in 1994, um, he voted for the disastrous crime bill. Uh, and a lot of Democrats were were wrong about about that that crime bill um and i i do think that it did originate with good intent but ter it had terrible um impact on on black and brown communities around the country um instituting three uh, three strikes and you're out uh and uh you just go on and on and on about how bad that was um and we would have given bobby rush a pass um because of, of the information that was available then relative to what's available now. Um, but 25 years later, 
um, in the mayoral election here in Chicago, um, he supported a candidate uh, for, for mayor, and there were plenty to, to choose from, um, that in broad daylight, in an effort uh, to reduce crime, proposed that we spend $50 million in drone surveillance um, in black and brown communities. That is the same, uh, the, the same method that uh, the 1994 uh, crime bill um, instituted, which does nothing but militarize and criminalize communities. Uh, so that means Bobby Rush, even though he said that was the, the, the worst thing he's ever voted for, um, he hasn't learned from it. Um, and it's important to learn from your mistakes. So that's, that, 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 that's, that's one thing. Another thing that, uh, that, uh, that just makes us drastically different um, is our understanding of how to solve the climate crisis. Uh, Bobby Rush sits on the Committee on Energy and Commerce. Um, so the Green New Deal uh, resolution went through his jurisdiction in which he called a smashing grab. Um, that he's glad is out of his committee. Um, and that should come at no surprise to the people of the 1st Congressional District or folks around the country, uh, because Bobby Rush is also taking money from the fossil fuel industry. Um, and this is all the while uh, we, including myself um, in the 1st District uh, of Illinois, have some of the highest levels of asthma uh, in, than any other place in, in the country. Uh, yet we have a sitting congressman who had, who is in the a committee that could help solve um, the climate crisis um, by passing resolutions um, that would put us on the trajectory towards reversing the impact of climate and guaranteeing jobs. And I've already alluded to the fact that that is gun violence prevention um, right there. Uh, Bobby Rush is, uh, is out of touch uh, with his constituency because the vast majority of the people I speak to in the first district of, of, of Illinois, they want the Green New Deal. Uh, they want Medicare for all. They want us to address gun violence at its root causes. Um, Bobby Rush is, is late to the party. Um, and what we've been saying and what other progressives around the country have been saying is out of touch, out of office. Yeah. Um, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, President Barack Obama ran against Bobby Rush um, in 2000. And Barack Obama, uh, then state Senator Barack Obama, uh, said that Bobby Rush was out of touch and it was time for change. It's been 20 years since then, uh, so you can only imagine what the people of the 1st District feel uh, currently. And that is why uh, folks all around the district are so excited about this election um, and our candidacy, uh, because our mindset is fixated on the belief that we are the solution together, meaning one person alone, one election alone will not solve uh, the issues at hand. But when we come together actively pursuing justice and peace, uh, we can solve all of these problems, uh, but we got to do it together. And that is what I've been doing um, as a gun violence prevention advocate, as a nonprofit leader, and as a social innovator, both locally, nationally, and even internationally to solve some of these big issues. And I always do it with my community, not just for, uh, but with. And that really is the difference, I think, between grassroots candidates and community organizers, people who just know the issues of their community and someone who's been in Congress for years, decades, and like they just grow out of touch. Like this is kind of a similar story that I'm hearing. But, you know, throughout the country, you know, their candidates are running against someone who has been there forever. And maybe at first they had a lot of new, fresh, innovative ideas, but time has passed and they kind of just grew complacent and comfortable and just feel like, well, you know, I'm here. Here. I don't have to do much. I have, you know, the power of incumbency behind me. Um, and and just this is what I'm hearing. And it's so important that we get new blood in there, especially when it comes to the issue of climate change, because, it, you know, impacting violence in your community, that's something that you can you can make a huge amount of progress with. But in terms of like representing our entire generation, that's also incredibly important because it's people like you and I who we have to think about when you're se when we are senior citizens, what the world will be like after climate change really takes a toll. And it's scary, you know, so it's nice to see people 
step up and run for Congress. And I already know that anyone who's watching this, they already are going to be behind you 100%. Um, I think the choice is absolutely clear. So let me just have you make your pitch to my viewers. Um, tell them what we can do to help you, where we can donate, and how we can get involved. Because if you get elected, that's good, not just for the first district of Illinois. This is good for all of us because you're fighting for everyone across the country. This is a national movement. So what can we do to help Robert Emmons Jr. get into Congress? Thank you so much, Mike. I want to point out we have now received contributions uh, from folks in 41 different states around the country um, about ending everyday gun violence by addressing it as root causes, something that the media uh, oftentimes overlooks. We're making sure that the entire same page um, in terms of fighting for peace and fighting for safety um, and fighting for, for this generation to be the last generation faced with such violence. Uh, so we, we need your support. Uh, so visit our website at robertemmons.org, sign up to volunteer, uh, donate uh, to our grassroots campaign. Um, the current congressman, Bobby Russ, for decades has been taking money from the fossil fuel industry and other corporate PACs. That is not what we stand for. What we stand for is giving the keys to the House back to the people. The, and the people are the only, uh, only, uh, the only folks that we, we will be loyal to uh, when we make it into Congress in 2021. So join the movement, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to, to changing this country together. And we are all going to be rooting for you. Let me just make my pitch that I always do for candidates. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of people running for Congress, and so it's difficult. We're kind of stretching ourselves thin just as a movement. But even if you have just like a spare dollar, every single penny helps because when you're going up against someone who is part of the establishment that political status quo that is well financed you know you need people to get behind you and it seems like you've really hit a nerve because to get donations from 41 different states i mean think of that's so unprecedented right i mean to think that just 10 years ago what you're doing would be even possible um, it, it really does give me hope. Like everyone, it's easy to be cynical, but to see everyone across the country rising up, just normal everyday Americans who care, who care about the issues that affect their community, it really is. It's just, it gives me hope. So thank you for running. And please, to all of the people watching, consider supporting Robert. Um, anything you can do to help. If you can't donate money, then donating time is also incredibly crucial. And just spreading the word goes a long way. So it's uh, robertemmons.org. And on Twitter, you can follow him at rmmins2020. Robert, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much, Mike. Appreciate it. Well, that's all that I've got for you guys today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you've made it this far in the show, as usual, I want to thank all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members and send a special shout out to all of our YouTube members who get to watch these episodes early. You always comment. You always leave likes. Thank you all so much. I truly appreciate it. And um, I'm done talking. So I'll see you all next week. My name is Mike Figueredo. This has been the Humanist Report Podcast. Take care, everyone.